maybe why why people at Tricolina because yeah, just one. Super, yeah, yeah, it's not super important, but I can just uh, briefly uh, announce the uh, how it's called the schedule of both this session and the next one, so people know. And uh, I mean, uh, the information is anyway online, so I guess uh, if someone uh, comes in uh, afterward, it's not a big deal. Um, so yeah, today we try to focus a bit on. Uh, uh, primordial signals, uh, whereas the second session is going to be more on uh, uh, the local universe, but we also had to take into account uh, different time zones, uh, so it's not uh, exactly divided uh, for a um, topic. But yeah, today we're going to start uh, things off with uh, Joe Silk, which is going to talk us about uh, unveiling the universe with the CMB spectral distortion. Then uh, Katz Corey is going to talk about primordial black holes and the relation with spectral distortion. Katsuya Abe, constraints on dark matter halo formation in the early universe by free free emissions. Anastasia Sokolenko, about uh, constraining dark photons from uh, CMB data. Subodip, uh, oh, I'm not sure how to pronounce the surname, uh, but he's gonna. Um, he, he just said he will join in a second. So, oh, here, there he is already. Great. Yeah. yeah. Improving action like particles from uh, upcoming CMB experiment. Uh, Sandeep uh, uh, Sharia with the theoretical and theoretical numerical aspect of CMB spectral distortion from non thermal ele electromagnetic energy rejection. Hideki Tanimura uh, et al. I'm not sure what et al. means, but uh, he's going to talk about uh, the new Planck TSZ map and its cosmological analysis. Uh, Sunil Malik uh, about the implication of magnetic fields uh, on IGM temperature and TSZ affecting presence of dark baryon dark matter interaction. Organozoi of a CMB mu T cross correlation as a problem of primordial black hole scenarios. And finally, Mathieu Remezai of cross correlation between CMB polarization and mu distortion as a well path towards the detection of small scale primordial long Christianity. Uh, Mathieu probably is going to join us slightly late, but he's going to be here for sure. And uh, yeah, Jens, if you want to do the honors uh, on the. Yeah, program. yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. so. Um, uh, welcome everybody and uh, thanks obviously for, for uh, submitting so many nice uh, talks and, and uh, abstracts. Um, as Andrea was already saying, we had uh, quite a hard time uh, selecting and uh, we have two sessions. Um, uh, the, the second one will be on Thursday and uh, the program is pretty packed and Andrea mentioned it already. Uh, we will hopefully have some time um, you know, for of course questions uh, and um, hopefully also some time for discussion maybe at the very end. Um, uh, on the second session. So um, obviously the main goal of this session was to uh, really highlight the potential and possibilities with CMB spectral distortions. We all know that uh, CMB anisotropies has, have been a great source of information about the universe we live in. And uh, yesterday the session that Carlo Burigana was organizing was already really highlighting some of that and it was really exciting. Um, uh, we, are, we are trying to look at the spectral distortions and, and um, signals that are coming from the energy distribution. And uh, we are also uh, just as, as one very, very positive uh, um, uh, highlight at the moment, we, we, had, uh, we had submitted several white papers to both the Decadal and also the Voyage 2050 um, uh, process. And uh, uh, the report of the Voyage 2050, uh, uh, the evaluation um, was just published and it highlighted uh, CMB spectral distortions or spectroscopic CMB spectroscopy as one of the you know, uh, interesting targets or possible uh, probes of, of early universe physics, which is quite exciting for us and uh, very motivating, of course. Uh, this is on a timescale of you know, 30 years from now. Um, so lots of work to be done. And obviously uh, there's no uh, you know, guarantee that, that this will go forward, but uh, it means that one has to both from the theoretical side uh, point of view, as well as uh, from the experimental si uh, side, really start gearing up and organizing things. So um, we, are, we are hoping that this session will facilitate some of that. And um, I think there will be many more meetings which we, we need to uh, organize and bring together the community. Um, we, uh, we have uh, talks from several time zones. I, I dare say probably our American colleagues will not manage to uh, join us today. Um, but, uh, but then on, on, on uh, Thursday, we, when we have the afternoon session, uh, I think that we will have uh, more of our American colleagues uh, join. And nevertheless, I think this will be an exciting uh, um, uh, two sessions. And um, we don't want to, I, I, sh I think I should just uh, stop there and let, uh, let the uh, proceedings go on and go its way and uh, let really the speakers uh, make it do the work. And yeah, again, thanks a lot for everyone to join and, and for 
uh, let's let's hope for a really nice uh, small session today. Andrea, if you want to start or add yeah. something. Yeah, let me just uh, thank again uh, all uh, speakers and participants that are here with us today. It's a pleasure to have to see so many faces. Uh, so yeah, I think we can start uh, with uh, Joe Silk. Uh, he's going to talk us uh, about uh, unveiling the early universe with CMB spectral distortion. Um, Joe, you have uh, 25 minutes, uh, and then uh, there's going to be five minutes for uh, questions afterward. And whenever you want, you can share your screen. Sorry, I'm having some problem finding my screen. Can you... Uh, uh, maybe I can force what? you to share the screen. Let me see. Like on the bottom, there should be like a share screen with an arrow, right? Okay, I'm um, sorry about this, but I seem to have lost, I can, I'm trying to find my window. That's my problem at the moment. Uh, after, after trying uh, too many times, you know, the computer says, now I will, now I will play the trick. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As sorry. usual. <laughs> sorry about this. No worries, no worries, no worries, no worries. Um, where are we here? Gosh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just, um, I can obviously hear all of you, but I've lost my screen somehow and I don't quite know why. Um, like, I mean, alt tabbing, alt and tab. Maybe, I, I mean, I'm actually, I'm not sure if it works on a MacBook, but Jens? Yeah, um, command tab, uh, Joel, normally so shows you which uh, where the windows are. Uh, command, yeah, I'm on a slightly strange system. Um, let's try escape. Um, in principle, command should get me back, right? Sorry about this, folks. Um, I clearly have you somewhere on some screen. You can see me, no doubt, right? We can we can see you, um, Joe. If you if you just uh, uh, if you just unplug the other screens, maybe then it will will appear. No. Um, I am trying to close everything. We call this forfeit effect. Um, so you try every time, and then uh, you know when you have the uh, when you have the real uh, presentation, then it doesn't work. You know, and and everything worked before, and then when you know. No, no. My my problem was I I read the chat, I brought up the timetable, and then everything else vanished. So I'm sorry about that. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> so I'm on a screen somewhere, but I um... Okay. Hmm. I'm really sorry for this, but I am... Um, Maybe... Clearly, I have you somewhere because I can hear everybody. And see, you can see me. Okay, I'm going to try another computer quickly. Okay, maybe we can have, uh, if uh, Katz doesn't mind, uh, his, his talk first and then come back to, to Joe's uh, right afterward. Uh, Is that okay, Kaz, with you? I, I can of do course, this. Uh, it's okay, I, but... Hello, I can do this immediately, actually. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. We, we can wait for Joe, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. we, we will probably. I think I think the official, the official uh, um, time slot uh, closes at 10 minutes after or 15 minutes after, so we, we probably will be uh, 
we will we will just fit. Okay. So in principle, I'm joining now. I'm trying to join now, but will it even let me? That's the question. Um, Should be a way to go through the windows here. I'm not doing that successfully. Oh, I see Rashid also managed to join us just, just yeah, now. Thank you. For Hello, Rashid. Yes. Thank you. We're, we're, we're just trying to, um, yeah, we're just about to start. Welcome. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. So my problem, hello, Rashid, is that I have lost I my draw. window. So, uh, <laughs> and this is not good. Right. I know that. Okay. I'm here somewhere, but I've lost my screen. Oh, Tauber is with us. Real people are here with you. <laughs> I know, this is really, really embarrassing, folks. I, uh, Andrea, uh, can you ask Joe to, uh, to share his screen explicitly? Because then it will pop out up on his um, window, probably. No, I'm not sure about that. No. You can do it on the or give me host. I can I can ask as well. We had tried it, as I said, and now it is uh, not working. Yes, it also was continuous shame. There were some. It's okay. Finally, everything was okay. Joe, okay. did you find that win? Right, right. There you go. Yeah. Got you. Here we go. Okay. Really, really Perfect. sorry about this. Okay. Let's, so I no share, worries. I share screen. And let's yes. see if I can even find my talk. This looks good. Very good. Okay. Um, so now I have somehow to um, fill the screen. Let's see. Now there should be a button uh, play on the top right. Be that. See if that works. Okay, we're in business. Okay, really sorry about the uh, these uh, uh, little uh, dis adventures. Anyway, here we go. Um, I'm going to tell you in a very general way what we're going to do with spectral distortions. Um, so let's begin. Um, there's been no progress since Firas. Um, amazingly, more than 30 years ago. Um, the isotropies, of course, are a great triumph, and they, you know, take us back to 380,000 years after the Big Bang. In principle, we, we can do we can do better um, with spectral distortions. Going beyond tensor fluctuations, it's the next major goal for the next decade. That that'll release just a few million modes, of course, the numbers of pixels in the CMB sky. And I don't want to be negative about this, but it doesn't have a robust prediction of an inflationary signal. And so it's very important to develop other channels at the same time. And I think spectral distortions, which will uh, unveil trillions of modes and give you guaranteed signals are a very important complement to our polarization search for the CMB. Okay, so, um, the story begins um, really with um, the, uh, Rashid and, and his uh, 
doctoral supervisor who developed the concept of um, spectral distortions, um, the early mu uh, variant and the late Y variant, I'll say a bit more of those in a moment. Um, the predictions were from um, early injection of energy. One does not um, uh, produce conserves the number of photons um, because it's simply Compton scattering. One produces a, a gray body like distortion um, in, in, in this example of the mu distortion. And then in late distortion where scattering is inefficient, you simply um, are um, conveying energy to the, to the photons and um, put them in the high frequency tail. So these are two amazing windows on the universe. And we're trying hard to go beyond uh, our perfect black body from from FIRAS. Can we do much better? Well, the answer is in principle, we can. Um, here is uh, basically uh, a schematic of how far back we can go. Um, the, the wide distortions, the late epoch, the early epoch with the um, uh, extreme energy injection and um, intermediate things. And I want to tell you about how we can probe, summarize about how we're going to probe the Big Bang, going back to the last scouting service and well, well beyond uh, where these distortions are, are produced very early. So all of this is well known to all of us. Um, let me just summarize uh, the distortions we're looking for. Um, our best hope is to uh, probe the first um, years of the universe, thousands of years to months after the beginning, uh, with uh, the mu distortions. Recall that the CMB is thermalized very early by a combination of Bremsstrahlung and double Compton scattering, which create black body photons. Um, that's earlier than a redshift of 2 million. After that, uh, one fails to thermalize. One enters, first of all, the efficient Compton scattering regime where you add energy, produce a Bose Einstein like mu distortion. Um, and the amount of the distortion is just directly connected to the energy injection. And then at later times, um, once you enter the matter dominated era, um, when Compton scattering becomes inefficient, you simply transfer energy from low to high photons and produce the famous mu distortion. So, um, uh, these have had so many applications. Um, we can probe small scale power uh, in the power spectrum of fluctuations, which is predicted, of course, uh, by our standard model of cosmology. And then we can look for slightly more exotic things like um, dark matter decays, um, the uh, dissipation of gravitational waves, evaporation of primordial black holes. All of these leave imprints but there's no guaranteed signal of um, these exotica. The, the robust probe of our current model uh, is gonna be through mu distortions uh, eventually uh, and cosmic recombination. Why? Because we can look, for example, at the um, pillar of the cold dark matter model, which is small scale structure, the bottom up formation. We, we can look for power on high wave numbers. And ultimately, we can even look for recombination lines, which would be an amazing test of atomic physics in the early universe. So here you have um, the argument for small scale power. We probe beautifully large scales with the microwave background and um, soon large scale, very deep surveys will um, uh, will illuminate this even further. On the small scales, what happened before we made our structures we see on small scales is, is uncertain. There should have been in the standard model lots of structure here. And early on, um, there was a prediction, very, very low compared to Firas by five orders of magnitude of where we should be looking. Um, so what are the prospects for getting there? Well, um, at the moment, uh, we have complete uh, uncertainty about these very small scales. Uh, on the large scales from Planck, of course, cosmic variance is a killer. We can't do much about that. But on the small scales, we simply need uh, to collect more information by higher resolution. And 
may be with the microbe background, um, we'll be able to do much better with the mu distortions. And so the mu distortions currently um, at this level from FIRAS take us back to a level that's um, far, far weaker than um, uh, we probe on large scale structures with the CMB. This is the power spectrum I'm showing you. But in principle, um, and then of course we have other ways of attacking uh, small scale power uh, with um, uh, looking for gravity wave background signals or primordial black holes. But the future is exciting because here we have a forecast which takes us to um, uh, beyond proposed and so far in successful experiments to the, a new regime of future experiments. We can hope to get down to the level of the fluctuations that will be a direct prediction of our standard model and so far totally unavailable um, in um, our study of initial fluctuations via the microwave background. So future experiments are um, a wonderful thing for the future. And I'm going to just um, summarize where we may be going in this direction. Um, so in addition to the small scale structure, uh, there's a search on now for the gravity wave background um, on uh, uh, low frequencies, um, if you like very uh, small scales, this will come from black hole uh, merging physics. Um, and um, we have a whole glorious future mapped out ahead of us um, on these very high scales, which will give information about the early universe. There's a hint of a stochastic background, but what's exciting is that as we turn up the power beyond fire ass, uh, we will be able to project future missions that can directly complement the hints from gravity wave experiments of stochastic backgrounds. And so we can fill in this gap, that, that's a wonderful thing to do. Um, the, uh, uh, and that'll be uh, something for, well, we're projecting as far away as 2050, but that something is, is gonna happen inevitably, I think, that we'll be able to get some handle um, connecting the uh, very uh, large scales with the very small scales. And this would be a wonderful, I think, multi-messenger approach. Okay, so um, then there is another component of what I call exotica. We have no idea what the dark matter is. Um, we've probed right now models of dark matter that decay, elementary particles that decay um, on very, very slowly. These are great candidates for dark matter. But equally, one can imagine that dark matter is produced by decaying, rapid decays of more massive dark matter particles. There's a whole class of models out there that suggest this uh, to make long lived dark matter. How can we test this? Well, we look for decaying dark matter on shorter time scales, again, giving you energy input, producing mu distortions. And here you can see some of the projected limits which will take us back with, um, with a future experiments to um, interesting fractions that we can set on, um, on, 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 uh, on such uh, components of dark matter, uh, which will uh, enable us to fully explore the physics of decaying dark matter. So that's something, it's not a guaranteed uh, prediction for a future experiment with spectral distortions. Likewise, um, Evaporating black holes have been uh, a major industry. Uh, we have not yet seen any direct evidence for this. There's theoretical arguments um, that black holes will evaporate. How do we test this? Well, we can use the gamma ray background for the more slowly evaporating black holes that um, um, on time scales of order 10 to the uh, um, ninth, 10 to the eighth years that leave um, gamma ray signals um, as part of their uh, uh, production. But to go back even earlier, the only hope would be the mu distortion. So complementing the gamma ray limits, you can see that one can in principle with future experiments uh, probe interesting mass ranges of black holes. And I should say that we're getting to black hole masses in the window that's um, interesting for, um, 
for dark matter detection experiments. So testing these things uh, would be uh, a complement of the idea that um, asteroid class black holes over here somewhere may be uh, a dark matter component. If, if they exist, then it's logical there should be smaller ones too. And it would be great to find evidence from new distortions of their existence. So um, let me now put the theory aside for a moment and take you into the experimental regime. And so the future of this field is in spectros spectroscopy of the far infrared um, CMB limits. Um, Pixie, which has been discussed for decades now, was twice rejected by NASA. It was a 55 centimeter telescope with a single detector in the focal plane. It was designed to reach about 1,000th of the fire ass uh, limits. Um, this was perhaps deemed insufficient. Uh, we don't really know for sure, but one has to do better to tackle these cosmological goals. So basically, this, is, this means um, uh, a um, a pixie on steroids. Um, and here is one example of having basically a larger telescope. Um, this would be one and a half meter. You have to go into space, a space telescope with um, several um, um, uh, uh, interferometer detectors, um, uh, Fourier transform spectrometers, basically several units um, involved. Uh, feeding in. And the idea with such a spectrometer is you have a, a reference black body that you test against the sky. Um, uh, you, you split the beam and then combine the two and look for deviations. And in principle, with a board of 10 detectors and a 1.5 meter telescope in space, you can reach uh, levels of mu as low as 10 to the minus not 9, which takes you down to the, the, the holy grail, really, uh, peritory and explore territory that should bring some interesting results and some possibly guaranteed results. And that's what I want to focus on now. Well, where do you put such a telescope? Well, um, in space is certainly one option. Um, uh, the Voyager program, ESA Voyager program is exploring this. Um, it's a long way in the future. It's very, very expensive, but here is another option. We're going to the moon anyway, so at great expense, we'll have the infrastructure all set up. So it shouldn't be too hard to put telescopes on the moon. And ESA indeed has one such project with the EL3 lander projected for launch in 10 years with the one half kilogra kilogram payload. It could possibly take modules of Fourier transforms interferometer with a telescope in a, in a module. Um, here's one example, you would have a of course, the reference black body on board, uh, touching get the, compared to the sky, um, you would need to cool the telescope um, to two and a half Kelvin. That can be done. Um, here's the diameter again. One and a half meters is a good thing. It can fit in the payload of such a of such a, a cargo, um, and the frequency range would take you up to the terahertz range. Um, so you're looking at a one and a half ton payload, perhaps you would sky scan. You don't need to actually have a telescope that tracks the sky. The moon will do it for you. And you could go to a permanently shadowed crater um, on the moon near, the, near, near one of the poles, but probably the lunar south pole, where the temperatures reach 30 Kelvin, a great place to start putting in your improved cryogenics. And you can, in principle, with such an instrument, do better than fire ice by the, the the desired five orders of magnitude. And the major interesting thing about such an option is that the budget, you know, it's a tiny fraction of the total overall budget and may be easier to access than a pure space budget. It, because when it's in competition with so many other things there, it's hard to see how necessarily how such a thing could survive. Oh, the moon seems like a good place. Anyway, let's go back to theory. So we know, uh, why would you do such a thing? What is the real motivation behind this? I alluded to this previously, but let's pick it up again, looking to the future. Um, we know about atoms in the universe, um, uh, thanks to the optical depth from measured from Planck and, and um, earlier instruments, etc. cetera. And uh, we, we, we map out the neutral fraction with quasars, and we now see Lyman alpha emitting galaxies. We, we go back roughly, we know the universe is largely neutral, back beyond redshift of um, seven or so. Um, we also know about the stellar mass, thanks to interesting recent measurements. 
which look at the most distant galaxies and say, aha, there are stars in them that have a certain age. Let's try to diagnose that age. And we learn that most of the stellar mass formed in the big galaxies at redshifts of around 10. So this is how far we can trace conventional mass back um, with, uh, by using known physics. The, there is a hint of um, possibly taking us back to redshift 17 um, from atomic hydrogen seen as absorption in the Eddis experiment. This is yet to be confirmed. That that would be a wonderful next step for the global signal of H1. But there is an earlier probe of atomic physics that I think is really, really exciting. And let's try to address that. And that is um, using the recombination lines of hydrogen and helium, which in principle give you energy distortion signals of the cosmic microwave background. And so here you see the um, the various predictions of the lines from hydrogen and from helium. And so wouldn't it be amazing to do atomic spectroscopy of cosmic recombination? Now, recombination of hydrogen occurred um, at ratio to 1,000. Helium, with its somewhat higher energy levels, re recombined somewhat earlier. So we can probe atomic physics at ratio to 1,000, 10 to the fourth, by looking at these lines. And what is, in, to me, the most important and impressive statement is that this is a guaranteed science return. It has to be there. OK, so um, um, here then is a, um, a brief overview of the sensitivities involved. So I plotted at the bottom here the spectral lines. Um, and at the top, you can see that the fire ass limits um, on spectral distortions. The big obstacle is, of course, going to be the foregrounds in, in gray here. But there are clever ideas under study for dealing with these foregrounds. There are spectral and spatial signatures. You know, it's going to be a tough battle when you look at these desired signals, several orders of magnitude. We did, we did this for <coughs> temperature anisotropies. Maybe we should be able to be clever enough to do this for these uh, more subtle signals in, this, in the spectrum. Um, here in, um, oh, in quadrature, um, so this is the negative part of the spectrum where this peak goes up, you have um, the Y signals and the predicted mu signals. And um, the ultimate um, mu signal, the guaranteed return, is going to be this green line. You can see it's well above future projected experiments, if we can really fund the optimal spectral distortion experiment, and that will also get us into the regime of, of, the, uh, of the spectral lines. So let me try to bring things together for you. Why are we looking for spectral distortions? Well, we're testing our current best model, Lambda CDM. They're a unique test of bottom-up structure. Um, we're detecting, in principle, recombination lines. We could see the first atoms in the universe, right? We've had a we had a revolution of astronomy with the with the nuclei, nuclear physics. Imagine doing atomic physics in the context of the Big Bang. This, to me, would be you know really the holy grail of all of this because recombination line physics is what astronomy lives on, and we could basically get to this regime going back to bridge of 10,000 by measuring these lines. And in principle, have a pure and pristine measurement of the helium we've understood. And then we could look for more exotic energy inputs from evaporating primordial black holes to um, decay dark matter to inflationary waves, their dissipation, gravity waves. So that, that's why we're doing this. Um, so Five minutes uh, left. OK, so that, that's fine. This is my um, uh, concluding slide, really. Um, I think it's highly futuristic. Um, what we're discussing, but you know, it's got to it's got to happen eventually because the spectrum of the CMB is such unexplored territory. Uh, one has to wonder about these time scales, but we're used to this in particle physics. Uh, big projects have long lead times. Uh, we're discussing hundred TV particle colliders um, on the horizon of twenty fifty. We're discussing now major new experiments in astronomy on a similar timescale. 
uh, this uh, spectral distortion experiment will be a contender for these. Will it be a free flyer? That will be a very important question to decide. It'll be in competition with, with, um, with many, many other major experiments. But maybe uh, I would say a possibly more realistic and in the, in the budgetary sense approach might be to use a dark lunar crater this would be expensive, truly expensive, but it's an ideal site. Um, you don't, you know, you just let the rotation of the moon cover the sky for you. You look at the sky with your Fourier transform spectrometer. And to me, it, it seems almost a no brainer. And it'll be amazingly expensive, of course, to go to the moon, but we're doing that anyway. And let's imagine that the funding for such an experiment, it, it could piggyback on lunar exploration. Just let me remind you that, you know, Hubble, telescope probably would never have flown were it not to the space shuttle and the National Space Station. It was a basically, you know, a few percent increment on their cost. In the same sense, lunar telescopes, and this need not only be the spectrometer, of course, we talk about radio telescopes on the far side, are a small increment of our, of our future planning for the moon. So I'm happy to um, say this could be uh, our future. One way or another, I think we need to get there with this. Um, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, maybe we can all unmute ourselves and give uh, Joe a small round of applause. Thank you very much for your nice talk. And uh, yeah, if uh, are there any questions, please uh, either raise your hand or um, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, well, like in the, in the meanwhile, like um, I'm wondering, uh, is there any negative downside uh, beside cost uh, in uh, doing spectroscopy from the moon uh, rather than uh, uh, space? Uh, like, I mean, there might be a very, very thin atmosphere that still, or like dust uh, that uh, hinder our detection ability, or uh, is uh, just a matter of uh, having to land on the moon, which is a costly action to perform? It seems to me that it's getting to the moon that's the most expensive part of this. So, uh, and getting to uh, and the craters on near the South Pole are targeted actually by the space agencies. Many of them actually, you know, uh, around the world now as being places for future development. Putting telescopes there seems to me a logical next step to do. And um, if we're going to use a crater, then um, you know, optical telescopes are going to be a challenge because of dust issues. Um, but the dust does settle down at night. Um, it, you know, it's photoelectric charge, etc. So we don't know about that really. But a far infrared device uh, seems to me like a very interesting thing. There are other ide ideas out there too for using the moon. Uh, and the far side where we don't see the Earth will be a great place to do low frequency radio astronomy. So I think it's going to happen um, sooner or later. And um, uh, you know, it's a great thing to push for, I think, at this moment uh, we, we, as we plan for the future. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, maybe Jens has a quick question. Yeah, um, Joe, um, you mentioned uh, exotic uh, physics as well. Out of those exotic physics, which which of those would you uh, think uh, has has a, has the best motivation, or maybe linked to what is currently going on in in, uh, in other uh, you know other directions, um, early universe studies? Well, I guess my starting point would be to think of um, physics that is less exotic than other physics. And I, I think primordial black holes, for example, are physics that are based on, you know, standard models of gravitation. They, they fit naturally into many inflation models, et cetera, if you tune the initial condition slightly. Um, and maybe they're even generic actually. And making them of small mass is, is logical too, um, because they, this happens very early. So I think their evaporation signal is to my mind, the, an exciting thing to look for in the spectral distortion. So you know, there are other things too, but I would put, put that at the top of my list. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, so maybe let's give uh, Joe another round of applause. And uh, uh, I will ask uh, uh, Kaz Kori to share his screen. Now. Okay. Can you see his castle? Castle is a... And looks, yeah, looks great, yeah. Mm -hmm. castle. 
Good, good, good. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, great. Okay, shall we start? Hmm. Okay, that's great. Okay. Uh, okay, you have uh, 15 minutes. I'm going to give you a warning of 15 minutes prior. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. It, this, today, I'd like to discuss the relation between flammable cores and the new distortion, well, spectral distortion of CMD. I'm Kazuko from Japan. I'm not in Japan, it's uh, uh, evening now. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, we have strong motivation to study prime model black, black holes because uh, it, could, it would be a good target probed by gravitational wave motivation, like uh, by LIGO, VAGO, and recently Kagura, Japanese, Japanese in, instrument, Kagura. And the, actually, the, so far, the detected event, say GW1509.14, could be fitted by primordial, binary primordial black holes by assuming just a 0.1% you know, of CDM. Just by assuming 0.1% of CDM, then automatically uh, binary formation and coalescence rate was fitted by primordial black holes. And the, the, through the three body effect of the formation of the primordial black hole, then automatically it can fit the event rate. So it's very amazing. So. Uh, yeah, in astrophysics, there are also many uncertainties for producing binaries and coalescence rates. So uh, it, the primary black hole is one of the strongest candidates to, the, to be a you know, signal of this kind of gravitational wave observation. Okay, so we have a strong motivation to study primary black holes. And in future, uh, by using the DESIGO or BBO, a future observation, Gravitational wave motivation that we can discriminate the primary black hole binaries to, we, to, uh, from the astrophysical black hole binaries yeah, by observing the red shift up, down to up to 15, 15. Then we can discriminate the primary black hole signal is flat as a function of red shift z, but the, for astrophysical black hole has a sharp dependence due to the star formation rate. Uh, and so we could. We, in principle, we can discriminate the primary depth or from astrophysical black holes. It's a very impressive point. And uh, in the early universe, if we we have a large fluctuation at small scale, fluctuation in the uh, curvature perturbation, then such a uh, large fluctuation can collapse into a closed universe, namely the black holes, and uh, you know, uh, it might it might survive until now, and uh, correct yeah by using a very simple argument about related with Presecta like Gaussian Gaussian treatment, then we can easily understand the number density of the produced produced primary the backwards by the curvature perturbation. So if the density perturbation is larger, a critical one it would be the order of one third in um, radiation in the early radiation dominated epoch then that region with the wavelengths k over a or momentum is k over a k is in wave number moving wave number that region could collapse into a black hole like a closed universe locally local closed universe then we can we yeah, we can relate the number density with the magnitude of curvature perturbation. Then see by integrating the Gaussian distribution of the density perturbation from the over curvature perturbation from a critical value to say over the unity, then we have estimated the uh, energy fraction at the formation of primary black hole namely the numerator is the PBH energy density and the denominator is the energy, total energy density in radiation dominant universe, then it's an error function of Gaussian. And we know that this sigma is the order of density perturbation. So we have one-to-one -one correspondence with the abundance of primary black hole. It's called beta in this community. It's a fraction, energy fraction at the formation time like an omega parameter at, at the an early universe at the time, at the cosmic time. It has a one-to-one -one correspondence with the curvature perturbation P zeta. It's living on the shoulder of the exponential. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence with beta and the P zeta. 
And beta is also related with the omega parameter at present. So to be 100% of the CBM, then uh, fraction would be 10 to minus 18. It's just a fraction of the patch, a local patch of Hubble horizon at that time. For to produce 10 to 15 gram PBH, it's evaporating at now. And we can exclude it by observing gamma rays or electron positron emission. Okay, uh, this is just a simple treatment only by the press sector, but uh, uh, it's better to st study it by peak theory. And uh, we, we have much more complicated expression for, for the yeah, abundance. Okay, next. Then, yeah, uh, so uh, important variables like that. Today I may discuss that say 10 to 15 gram PBH or 10 to 13 gram PBH and it mm -hmm. produced at around the, the 10 to 8 GB, 10 to, that's right, 10 to 8 GB. And you know Hawking radiation and uh, by emitting Hawking with radiation, the, it has a lifetime. And uh, uh, so 10 to 15 gram PBH have a lifetime of cosmic age, the current current age of the universe. Yeah, and that, that temperature would be MeV, so we can observe it by gamma rays at present. And it it it's also evaporated in the other universe for smaller PBH. And for wave number to produce that from the black hole is like that. So if wave number K is order of 10 to 5 megapascal inverse, then the horizon crossing is at around 1 MeV and the the horizon mass is order of 10 to 4 or 10 to 5 solar mass. So to produce the okay, 10, to, 10 to 5 solar mass as a seed of black hole for the supermassive black hole, then we need the large perturbation which, horizon, which crosses the horizon at MEB. And I said there is a one to one correspondence of abundance to the, the curvature perturbation like that. So if to the fraction to the CDM is related with like that. So, uh, okay, if the mass was 10 to 15 grams, then beta is 10 to minus 18. So it's a very small fraction of patch is Hubble patch can fract into PBH. For 30 solar mass, it can explain the LIGO event and beta is order of 10 to minus 18. So, and the P zeta is living in the shoulder of exponential, but the small change of P zeta gives a big change of F parameter fraction. So we, we, we have one to one correspondence between F fraction to the CDM and P zeta. Okay. Then, yeah, as already Joe Silk uh, introduced the uh, spectrum distortion, I would like to repeat again the a series of, series of those people, the, which they reported the upper bound, observation upper bound of mu and the y parameters. If the temperature was you know, smaller than one keV, then W Compton scattering decoupled. So extra photon cannot observed by the perfect uh, Bose-Einstein uh, distribution. So the, it, has, it created mu distortion like that. And after temperature was about 10 electron volt, then Compton scattering also decoupled. This is a very naive idea. So Jens Kruber studied a much more uh, precise one, but, but this is naive understanding. And then uh, why distortion might, might be produced by the scattering. Then, yeah, we can consider my parameter. Yeah. And uh, so in terms of parameter black hole, there are two types of distortions. The first is uh, the due to photon heating through dissipation of photon fractation, like, like through silk damping. So if the perturbation is large at locally, then it can dissipate and produce extra photon compared with the number density conservation. The energy density has, is, has an excess. It will produce mu, mu parameters, chemical potential, if the temperature was say one kb or less than one kb or cosmic time was longer than two times ten to six seconds, then it can produce sizable mu parameters. Then the prime of the black hole of the range of point ten to five or ten to four to ten to eleven 
could be excluded. This is the first, first example. A second was uh, extra heating by the, the evaporation through the Hawking process. Then the extra photon or quark and gluon can quark and gluon can fragment into my pions and it, the five zero decays produce a copy of the gamma and electron positron can produce the extra photons and like the electromagnetic energies and it can induce the finite finite mu parameters and it can be also excluded by upper band from the fires then we exclude the range of the mass my black hole's mass from 10 to 11 gram to say 10 to 13 gram. So uh, it's a gram, here is the solar mass. So uh, yeah, so there are two types of uh, disto uh, exclusions by CMB distortions. Okay, and the completely minutes, uh, today, yeah, I, how, how much, sorry? Five minutes. How much, five minutes, five minutes. Left, Okay, yes. I may Thank you. briefly, the, the, okay. Yeah, so dissipation is very important because uh, yeah, photon diffusion corresponds to 10 to 5 megaparsec at uh, this epoch, time was two times 10, 10, 10 to 6 seconds. So it's not a horizon scale, it's a dis diffusion scale of photons. Then, yeah, it can pro erase, uh, produce a mu distortion. So this region, 10 to Four solar mass to 10 to 11 solar mass is excluded by the upper band of the mu distortion, mu parameters. Yeah, this is, shows the dissipation of photon, and this is a horizon scale. So horizon scale is larger than this dissipation scale, dissipation scale, and this region is completely excluded due to the mu distortion. So there's a difference between the Hubble scale and Hubble horizon scale and the dis 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 dissipation scale. That's a very important point. Okay, next. Uh, so uh, as a function of P, P zeta as a function of K, so PBH formation excluded here and the mu distortion and Y distortion is excluded here. And we know the, the Corby normalization at the large scale for the CMB fluctuation, but if we, to plot the straight line, or maybe yeah, today the organ was they discuss the, this kind of straight line by the single field inflation, then it may touch the mu distortion. But if we consider uh, the learning of spectral index alpha or learning of learning beta, then uh, if, if learning learning is 0.02, which is still allowed by Planck 2015 or 2018, then it can reach the this region order 10 to minus 1.5 or something at small scale, 10 to 6 megaparsec, but then it's okay. So if we assume this kind uh, in the in inflation models that I say hybrid inflation, the this large learning or learning is realized, then it's yeah, prime the black holes can be produced at small scale. Okay, next. So yeah, mu distortion is very strong as a function of mass, the fraction to CDM, the completely this gray region is, has been exclu excluded. So, but, so 10 to, five, 10 to 4 to 10 to 11 or something. Yeah, this is a very strong uh, discussion, uh, observational bounds. But, yeah. But uh, as Josh Luc and the uh, collaborator reported that if the non entity at small scales exist, then this bound could be you know, relaxed. Like if we, they consider E2 minus delta P, the P, if P is not a two, like a Gaussian, it's a non gaussian entity may be represented by P equal different from two. Then if they assume the P equal one or something, the bound becomes much milder. Or if they consider P equal 0.5, then it's, of course, uh, it's good for another model. Then, of course, this P is related with FNL, normal FNL, Y1 to 1 correspondence. So we also show the, such a figure or something to, to have the relation between R1 to 1 correspondence, so P and FNL. Now, another heating is, I said, the emission by the Hawking process. And the extra photon can produce mu, mu, chemical, chemical potential mu, and from the upper band, 
we can exclude the beta parameter at around 10 to 12 gram, not the solar mass, 10 to 12 gram. And, uh, and according to yeah, this Acharya a series of good papers and uh, another group paper, we have excluded those regions by the distortion, you know, by the, the photon emission from the evaporating from the cause. So from the 10 to 11 gram to 10 to 13 gram, this region is excluded by distortion. But according to my works about the BBN bound, the currently the BBN bound is stronger. The mainly hadron emission from evaporating from the black holes. Uh, but the, according to yeah, Jens Gruber and the company, the, yeah, mainly I know the led by Sandeep Acharya, the, they showed that the, in future, the, the pixie like satellite can improve this bound completely. And this red region is my bound from the BBN, but the, not to produce destroy helium-4 and produce helium-3 or something. Then, yeah, in future, the CMB distortion may give the, the much more st much, much stronger bounds on evaporating from the black hole and uh, evaporating, yeah, uh, decaying particles. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I would like to conclude my talk. So, so far, the primordial uh, binary prime of the black holes are good candidates to explain the gravitational wave observation done by LIGO Berg, and currently joined Kagura. And uh, we can prove the high energy physics or the early universe and gravity theory uh, by using prime of the black holes. So in future, we will be able to distinguish a model of prime of the black hole formations or something from others by future observation of the CMB distortion by pixie-like satellites. So it's very good. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can mute ourselves and give uh, Katz a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and uh, we have maybe time for uh, one or two quick questions. Is there, uh, you can raise your hand if you want to pose a question. Mm. Otherwise, I'm going to ask one. Um, you mentioned a relation in between, uh, uh, you know, like um, the perturbation uh, and uh, FNL, uh, like, uh, and the exponent of uh, X per delta P. So ah, okay. It, Prime the black holes. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, is it? Uh, this, this one. Um, this one. No, no sorry. Later one. on, uh, just, I mean, in the second part of your uh, talk, uh, you were discussing FNL, uh, like ah. the primordial order non-Gaussianity, relaxes ah, the bound. Okay. This, this, this one. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, like, I mean, that's uh, uh, in a sense a scale dependent uh, because I mean we know that uh, on on uh, CMB scales, uh, FNL is very tightly right. constrained by Planck, uh, but like we don't we have zero information about what happens at a uh, smaller scale. Uh, is it uh... right? Right, but uh, you see, FNL has a K dependence, right? K dependence, even if it's a squeezed limit. So it, for each each k each k it has an uh, original FNL uh, independent FNL. But for this case, the small scale FNL, not the large scale CMB FNL. So yeah, they they said what we said that the only p prime the black hole can constrain the small scale FNL. Okay, so, so P, it's, P it's, parameter it's a, in this case. It's example yeah. to get uh, a wide range of uh, P values depending on the small scale FNL, which is not constrained to zero. Right. So, CMB observation, CMB cannot exclude this small scale CM, C, FNL. So, only by observing the prime of the black hole, it's sensitive to, to the okay. small scale FNL. Thank you. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Um, Shuvadeep has a question as well. Thank yeah, you. thanks. Uh, hi, guys. Very nice talk. Uh, Hello. I'd like to, hey, hey. I'd like to know about the uh, pressure part which you're discussing. So, as these are extremes, uh, yeah. So, how much room is there if you consider heavy tail scenarios uh, in the theoretical predictions of PBHS? Like instead of going through pressure sector, like a longer tail distribution. So, how much? Right, right. Yeah, prediction? Some, yeah. Yeah, very important point. Someone, for example, Tony Liotto's group, uh, very energetic to study the tail part, or mm -hmm. another group also to study. But the, 
Okay, the most of part are determined by the peak, peak, peak part. So in that case, the, there are no difference. But the, yeah, but the, yeah, uh, yeah, peak theory. <laughs> yeah. So, but if the tail only part be the is case, really important. Uh, because I, I was thinking that there can be a few but extremely rare scenarios of high density, which can push right. up my number of black holes to population. Even though they are rare, yeah, right. but they can be extremely high dense region in the tail. Yeah, you are right. You are right. And uh, but the presichta cannot, you know, select the the correctly the peak region. Right? It's yes. it, it's uh, insufficient. So so peak statistic is much more stronger or much more precise. Uh, peak statistics has uh, measure the yeah. the. the you know, coverage uh, derivative in the both both the both sides then in two D or something. Then it's much more st uh, precise. Okay. So Precision is insufficient. Okay, you are right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Let's give Katz uh, another round of applause. And uh, thank you very then, much. Thank you very much. And then we can uh, we can move to Katsuya Abe, who's going to talk about uh, constraint. Oops. Constraints of dark matter halo formation in the early universe by the free free emission. So you have uh, 10 minutes and the stage is yours, please. Can you see my screen? And uh, yes, can yes, you hear perfectly. me? Yes. Ah, okay, thank you very much. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Katsuya Abe, and uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, Nagoya University in Japan. And today I'm going to talk about the constraints on the early formed dark matter halo. So uh, in the cosmology, the primordial curvature perturbation uh, plays an important role uh, as the initial seas uh, of, for example, the temperature and astropy of cosmic microwave background and the cosmological large scale structure formation. And uh, these perturbations are believed to be generated uh, during inflation, uh, so the investigation of these perturbation uh, leads us to further understanding of the inflation. And uh, in the large scale, uh, the prime order path spectrum is well constrained uh, by the cosmological observations. And we know uh, the shape is uh, nearly scale invariant, and the amplitude is order of 10 to minus 9. And on the other hand, uh, for the smaller scale, uh, we have several constraints uh, through the, as I Joe mentioned, the new distortion or the non-detection of the uh, sign from gravitational collapsed objects such as uh, primordial black hole or uh, ultra compact mini halo uh, like this. And however, these constraints are somehow weak to uh, further investigate uh, the inflation. In this work, uh, we focus on the free free emission due to early formed dark matter halo, and we consider putting a uh, constraint on primordial uh, coverage path spectrum in this uh, small scale. So, first, uh, we estimate the free free emission intensity. Uh, from an individual halo. And the emission rate uh, is uh, given by this equation. And uh, as you can see in the equation, uh, to estimate it, uh, we need to know the internal profile uh, in a halo like this. So uh, we assume the hydrostatic equilibrium. And uh, also, we assume that uh, dark matter in the halo has an FW profile, and the gas in the halo has isothermal profile. And for the ionization rate, we apply the collisional ionization rate, and we also include the gas cooling. And from this assumption, uh, we can obtain a gas density profile. So uh, now uh, we have our, uh, enough information to calculate it. So uh, then we now uh, estimate the free free emission intensity uh, from an individual halos. So in the 
next step, uh, we want to know the sky average free free emission uh, in a given redshift cell. So uh, the equation to estimate it is here. And uh, to calculate it, uh, we need to know uh, the additional two terms. And the first term is here is a theta halo. Oh, sorry. A theta halo is a solid angle of a halo like this. And we know uh, the video radius. Uh, we can calculate video radius from a mass of halo. So we can calculate it. And uh, the other term is this one. And uh, this one is given by this equation. And uh, this is uh, related to the uh, number density of halos. And R is commoving distance from z equal zero to uh, give redshift. And uh, assuming uh, some uh, additional uh, the power spectrum uh, like this, uh, compared to the uh, scale invariant uh, power spectrum normalized by CMB, uh, we can uh, calculate the number density of halo uh, like this, uh, employing the pressure theory. And uh, this is a uh, uh, figure for the fixed uh, the web number uh, about the three megapascal inverse. Uh, this web number corresponding to the uh, halo mass uh, equal 10 to 12 uh, solar mass. And uh, now uh, we have, uh, we can obtain the sky average free free emission intensity uh, from uh, in a given red cell. So the last three, we just integrate uh, the this one, and uh, then uh, we can obtain the global signal uh, of free free emission intensity uh, from free free emission of early formed halos. Uh, please look at this figure. The horizontal axis shows uh, observation frequency, and the vertical axis shows uh, global signal in the units of uh, just the stradion. And uh, these uh, three solid line uh, shows uh, resulting uh, global signal uh, from a uh, reformed halo uh, formed by the such uh, additional uh, power spectrum. And uh, this yellow dash dot line and uh, this uh, dark red dotted line uh, shows uh, observation of free free emission. And uh, this yellow line uh, shows uh, uh, global uh, all sky average uh, in a free free emission. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this red uh, dotted line shows uh, uh, average, sky average uh, of free free emission only in the uh, high galactic latitude. So using this line, uh, for example, in this figure, we can exclude the, these two lines. I mean, the, these uh, resulting global signal should be in the red, this uh, shaded region. And uh, after this, uh, we also uh, calculate the difference uh, wave number, I mean, the difference uh, halo mass. And uh, finally, uh, we can obtain the constraint of prime order uh, coverage of our spectrum uh, like this. And the uh, horizontal axis shows a uh, wave number, and the uh, vertical axis shows a uh, bit theta. And uh, this red solid line shows a uh, uh, final result. And uh, this uh, wave number cutoff uh, is the controlled by the uh, PDL temperature uh, satisfy this equation. And uh, this equation is needed to keep the ionization rate equal units. So this is the final result. And uh, this is the summary slide. And we estimate the free free emission intensity by early formed halos and compare the existing observation of the free free emission intensity, we put the constraint for the prime order power spectrum as it is less than 10 to minus eight at 
in this wave number range. And uh, we are also calculating briefly emission from the PVH gas accretion scenario and uh, updating the abundance constraint like this. So, uh, yeah, I'm done. So, this is all for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk. I invite everybody to unmute and give a round of applause to him. Thank you. And uh, are there uh, any questions? Oh, yo, Jens already has uh, yeah, the hand raised, please. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for this talk. Um, uh, I was just wondering, uh, since you're talking about um, uh, at least today, quite nonlinear scales, uh, you know, the, a few inverse megaparsec, 100 inverse megaparsecs, and it is clearly coming from uh, the, the physics of, of the matter. How sure can you be that the link to the primordial power spectrum is still uh, preserved, really, uh, in, in terms of like interpretation uh, on, on these scales? Um, uh, how, 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 uh, how can you, yeah, isn't the nonlinear reprocessing of matter going to be very important and in particular uh, suppression of small scale power versus curvature perturbations, which are mainly present in the photon fluid at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, uh, you mean the, how the, put this constraint, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, now we are, in this uh, figure, we assume the like delta uh, function type uh, additional power spectrum, and the yeah, and the, from this uh, discussion, uh, we can uh, constrain for the mass variance for the uh, this uh, wave number. So the mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I mean the so to assume the p theta is a uh, delta function type uh, power spectrum uh, shape, so we can uh, uh, how to say we can correspond to the uh, mass variance constraint for the. Uh, prime order uh, power spectrum constraint in the corresponding scale. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry, we, uh, we can we can discuss independently. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so, and uh, Matteo also has a question. Yeah, uh, very good question. And also partly related to what Jens asked. Can you roughly estimate your error bars on this red line? Like, because I assume there are some uncertainty, both astrophysical and cosmological, like the one Jens mentioned. So can you roughly estimate what error bars you would have on these constraints? Um, yeah, so I think the, mainly the error bar is comes from the this let the line and the uh, sorry, I estimate this red dotted line from the this uh free free emission uh from a blank uh, observation data, and uh, we uh just uh in this work we just are uh, the average the uh, how to say. I mean, the mask, this region, uh, there is a, a high anastropic. So the I masked this region and the only using this uh, high galactic latitude region. And uh, I estimate the, how to say, free free emission only from the, this scale. And uh, yeah, we, now we only calculate uh last estimate this uh, value but uh yeah we need to uh consider the error uh for the calculation so yeah thank you for uh comment yeah i need to okay. check and uh, i estimate need thank to you. estimate thank you very much let's uh, give uh... Another round of applause. And uh, later on, uh, it's uh, um, Anastasia Sokolenko uh, talk about uh, constraining dark photon from uh, CMB data. Anastasia, please uh, yes. share your screen whenever you're ready. Yes. Uh, 
you have uh, 15 minutes. I'm going to give you a warning at uh, five minutes less. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, today I will talk about um, these two works that was done with these nice collaborators. And um, and of course, you're all familiar with uh, that we know that the standard model is incomplete. It cannot explain some of the phenomena. And one of these phenomena is dark matter. And uh, there could be plenty of uh, possibilities what is dark matter. And uh, it could be also hidden in so-called the um, hidden sector. And uh, we can connect to these uh, particles in this hidden sector by so-called portals. And in this talk, I will uh, discuss one of uh, this portal, dark photon, and how it could um, influence CMB and 21 centimeter physics. So what is dark photon? Dark photon is um, a model where it can uh, have kinetic mixing with ordinary photons, and um, there are plenty of constraints on such a model. And uh, today I will concentrate on this part for relatively low masses of uh, dark photon. And uh, if we have um, a dark photon, then uh, because it has a kinetic mixing, it can oscillate into ordinary photons and vice versa. But in a vacuum, this probability is very low. It's proportional to the coupling constant square that is quite small. However, in a media, ordinary photons they are not matters. And in the standard model, in the media, they interact with other particles uh, and effectively they became massive. And um, uh, their mass is uh, proportional to the square root of uh, number density of charged particles, roughly speaking. And um, if uh, this effective mass is equal to the mass of dark photon, then um, uh, the probability of such uh, a conversion is much larger than in vacuum. It's much larger than the gamma constant. And what uh, we wanted to study is where this condition holds, where we have this condition, and uh, how it could affect different sources, in particular CMB. And so first of all, uh, I will talk about um, what do we know about the number density of electrons and as a consequence, what is the effective mass of ordinary photons. And after um, recombination, we know that the number density of photons just decreasing with uh, redshift as a cube. However, at uh, lower redshift, uh, we started to have galaxies and so uh, we have brainization. So at low redshift, the number density increases and we have a lot of fluctuation around the average number density. And so um, when um, we have a resonant conversion, then the mass of dark photons should be equal to the mass of, um, uh, to the effective mass of ordinary photons. And it means that uh, for dark photon, we, we will just have some straight line, and where this line intersects with uh, these uh, red lines, then we could have resonant conversions. And as you see in this region, uh, we could have a lot of uh, conversions, thousands of them, and it could lead to uh, many observable effects. And um, in our work, we use um, simulations to extract the number density of electrons from simulations. And uh, there exists another approach where uh, the same can be done analytically. And it's described in these two papers. But in our approach, we use uh, in particular the Eagle simulation. And so we had different snapshot, a different redshift, and um, to have um, line of sites long line that we just stuck um, our small uh, line of sight together. We have a box 100 megaparsec and um, uh, to, to create uh, um, a long line of sight, we just stuck them together. And to be conservative, because we don't know what happens during realization. Uh, I mean, there are quite a lot of uncertainty on number density of electrons. So to be conservative, we just um, use the, the data from redshift zero to redshift six. And uh, we didn't take a, uh, realization into account because there are quite a lot of uncertainty there. So just an example uh, how the, this probability of conversion looks like. So um, uh, we have uh, many 
resonances and uh, to have the total probability of conversion, we should sum them all together. And so here's just an example for one um, parameter of, of this model. Because in this region, we have a lot of um, um, uh, a lot of conversions, so the probability is there is the largest. And so, um, so now uh, we know how to uh, what do we expect from this conversion? And then the next question, what is the best source to look at? And CMB is a great source because as we discussed here, and of course here are all familiar with CMB, it's to a very high precision is a black body spectrum and any deviation from this body, black body spectrum would be easy to observe. And um, um, when a, a photon propagates to us, usually, the probability to hit a galaxy or a cluster is quite low. So usually just photon propagates through the so-called cosmic web. And um, uh, if we take a CMB source, uh, then uh, we would have um, uh, two observable phenomena. So first we can uh, have a look at spectral distortions because it's a very high precision in black body um, uh, source. So if uh, we have uh, a lot of resonant conversions, then um, we would have some deviation because it depends on energy and so uh, we would be able to observe it. And if you modify the initial species in the spectra with fetch models, then we can put some constraints on mm, this model. Another effect comes from um, the fact that this um, conversions, it gives additional anisotropy and uh, one can analyze uh, these additional anisotropies that it doesn't, um, uh, it's not larger than uh, the Planck measurements of any other future experiments. So, uh, because uh, CMB photons come to us from any directions, uh, in our simulations, we took random line of size and then uh, averaged them out. Uh, and in this case, we find the probability of conversion. So here is our results. So in in this mass range uh, where we have conversion, uh, it's um, um, the strongest results at um, this for this particular model. Um, and of course, uh, similar results uh, have, we have from um, not we, but the Nazi group has used an analytical approach. And you can see here, like from comet virus, um, we get this line, and the prediction for Pixie it's of course stronger. So it was about um, dark photon and its constraints. And uh, we can go uh, further and uh, apply to it, for example, to one of the models that uh, could potentially explain um, the edges results. So uh, it is uh, measured uh, that the amplitude of um, absorption is twice larger than we predict, and there are several um, explanations for that. So the first is that the, CMB, uh, the spin temperature somehow is lower than we can predict. And of course, it can be done with new physics or whatever. But um, another explanation that was discussed in this paper is that we just have more photons at uh, the energy of 21 centimeter. So we measure it here. and. Um, it's, um, we don't distract this Planck inspector, but just at 21 centimeter, we just have more photons. And one of the possibility why we can have more photons at this energy is uh, the model that if you have axionic dark matter that could decay into dark photons, then these dark photons could um, convert uh, into ordinary photons. And at this energy, uh, you would just have more photons. And if this happens between redshift 20 and 700, then it could explain the um, measurement of from edges group. And so we took this model. So we, um, if it explains the, uh, the edges results, then we can go further and uh, look at this model and um, analyze uh, uh, the probability of conversion at lower redshift because at lower redshift, as uh, I showed uh, before, we have a lot of resonant conversion and um, we can constrain this model um, using this. And uh, we did it. So 
this blue line is uh, the parameter space that explains the edges results within this model. And, um, and uh, here we can put constraint from Planck and SPT on this uh, model. Uh, I hope uh, I can make it in 50 minutes. <laughs> so uh, I'll just uh, go to my summary. Yeah, you have uh, five minutes left. So it's oh, really? Okay. I was <laughs> a bit... Don't worry. Oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> I thought it's, uh, I, I will need more, but okay, great. Uh, so um, uh, we get um, similar results from spectral distortion and anisotropies on dark photo models and um, in this mass range, it's the strongest constraints and uh, one can get the even uh, conversion at lower redshifts from like zero to six. And um, uh, uh, also we can apply it to one of the models that could explain the edges results and constrain this model. And of course we can uh, even improve our constraints even further if we'll take into account small scale anisotropies that uh, we produce not. So um, just um, um, what we have uh, done here. Okay, thank you, I think. Uh, okay, thank you. Let's give Anastasia a round of applause. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any question from the chat or raise? Okay, uh, Shuvadeep, please. Sir. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the formalism part of the electron density. You are talking. So, do you how do you model the fluctuations in electron density? Because uh, what really matters in these calculations of the how the adiabaticity parameters changes. Oh, I mean, uh, we don't model. We take it from simulations. Um, so, um, we use this list string g simulation, and uh, we take the electron number density from these simulations. So. No, but there will be a special fluctuations. So the de special derivative of electron density. Uh, uh, the inverse of that will play a role. That just controls the adiabaticity parameter. That's right. You call it R. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, how will how is that changing as a function of redshift? Because that's what controls the probability of conversion. Um, I'm not sure that I understand you. So we take the electron number density from simulation and we just take the derivative. So that's it. So it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. So if you take the derivative, what I'm asking is how it typically changes because because the value of the adiabaticity parameter should be large for giving you a significant conversion. If it is very shallow, then it will not give you a resonant conversion. So, so you, you use Landau's inner formula, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just take it. So, so in Landau's inner formula, when you exponentiate the gamma factor, Okay, but we can talk about it in details later. It's not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, uh, we check that it doesn't depend on resolution a lot. I mean, um, because of course, uh, if you have a very sharp peak, then uh, it's uh, because it's derivative. It's of course uh, quite tricky when you work with derivative, and because in like our one pixel is twenty kiloparsecs, so it's uh, um, we average the electron density, but we check, and our results is. Um, hmm, uh, they converse, so um, uh, uh, we, uh, we check that. So it's... okay, okay, fine. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any other question? Perhaps I can um, really quick comment on it. So I mean, absolutely right because I mean, you see in the, the conversion probability, there's also a small parameter epsilon squared, and so we, we check that uh, that each resonance does not lead to a conversion that is. Uh, uh, order one efficient. So these are these are sn still small probabilities, and they add up. But of course, you could then also use. A, I mean, if you go into equilibrium, with the, when you really start sharing half half dark photons, uh, photons, so that that would be an extreme case, and then you would need a, a different, a slightly different formulation. But here, everything is under control. Okay, I see. Because what I was asking is because when you say the oscillation length scale, you need to compare the oscillation length scale with the scale of the derivative of electron density. And that what plays a role. So if your resolution should be finer than the typical oscillation length scale of dark photon to photon. Maybe we can uh, further this discussion uh, later on if uh, we have time. Mm -hmm. And uh, or I can open a breakout room. But, but uh, like now there will be the talk by Shuvodip. So maybe we want to. Um, oh yeah, sure. 
Like, I mean, after, after, after you talk, you have this discuss about this. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, let me find the title of which I, I lost. Yeah. Probing uh, axion like particles from the upcoming CMB experiments. So, please. Yeah. Ah, so sorry, it's 15 minutes. I'm going to give you a warning uh, at five minutes. So I can see your screen uh, and hear you just fine. Please. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, organizers, for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. It's a great meeting, and we have already heard quite a few interesting topics. So what I'm going to talk now is slightly different from other talks. I'm going to talk to you about how we can use CMB spectral distortions to discover axion-like particles. And here, don't think about spectral distortion only as a more uh, the term which is affecting your black body and the sky average quantity, but start thinking about the spectral distortion, which is also spatially fluctuating. So we can use both spectral and spatial information now to probe axion-like particles. So axial-like particles are a hypothetical particles currently. It is interesting to a very large group of physicists, ranging from particle physicists, theoretical physicists, and cosmologists. Because it's a possible candidate of dark matter, it has been proposed in several scenarios, and we all are somehow interested in measuring it. The interesting part is that, <laughs> apart from the gravitational interaction of axions, there can be also electromagnetic interaction, though can be very feeble, but can, there can be an interaction between photons and axions in the presence of magnetic field. And that's the part I'm gonna talk about today. So th this is a particular uh, aspect which is searched very uh, commonly in particular physics experiments, such as CAST, the CERN Axion Solar Telescope, where the idea is that we will be looking for flux of axions coming from sun, because sun have a magnetic field, so if this process is happening inside sun, we may be getting a lot of flux of axions. And the, then we in the lab tries to convert back axion to photon in the presence of a very high magnetic field of about nine Tesla. And this is, gives us our current best bound on the coupling strength between photon and axion shown by this G A gamma as a function of mass. And this is the work by CAST to 2017, the red line that you are seeing in the right-hand side corner the bottom plot. What I'm going to talk about is just the opposite effect. The effect is now, instead of converting from axion to photon, let's ask, can we convert photon to axion? And thanks to nature for providing us an excellent source of light whose spectrum we believe to know very well. And that's the cosmic microwave background radiation. The unpolarized source of light hitting us from all sides. So uh, what do you want to now understand that in the presence of magnetic field, if these photons are propagating is, as I'm trying to show by this simple cartoon diagram, you can see the state of the photon, which is parallel to the magnetic field gets converted to axion. And the one which remains is the one which is perpendicular to the magnetic field, which means I have, a, there's a physical mechanism because of axion and photon coupling in the presence of magnetic field, because of which you can take away some photons into axion and only one particular polarization states goes away if it is the magnetic field is along that particular direction, which implies that you generate a polarized spectral distortion on the cosmic microwave background. So now the game is where can we find this? The answer to this is everywhere where there can be magnetic field present, that's answer, but only thing we need, the magnetic field should be strong enough or can be modeled. And all those places we can go and hunt or look for this particular signature. And astrophysically, we have several systems such as Milky Way, galaxy cluster, voids where this signature can be looked for. In today's talk, I'll be only talking about galaxy cluster, but the, physics is applied to all this as well. So let's talk about galaxy clusters as an axion detector. So what I'm going to talk about is, let's say a background of photon photons are propagating through the galaxy cluster. And if the, the galaxy clusters have magnetic fields changing along the line of sight, then at the uh, particular electron density decided by the corresponding mass of the axion, you can expect to see a resonant photon axion conversion. That's the pictorially I'm showing you the image in the left-hand side. And you are looking for now a distortion around galaxy clusters in the polarization map of cosmic microwave background radiation. 
So to do this problem, which I explain in a very simple way, you need to solve a coupled differential equation where the omega shows the frequency of uh, photons, the, couple, the coupling matrix with a coupling between of photon mass shown in delta E, the mass of axion uh, with respect to the photon mass is shown in delta A, and the coupling between two in delta gamma A for different directions. And so this equation is written in terms that your propagation is along the Z axis, but it's, not, it's just a general expression one can write. So what you now should think about is you are basically have three states of propagation, two states of polarization shown by A X A Y, and the polarization st and the state of axion. So now you are as this propagates, there is a conversion between these three states, very sim similar to how we see neutrino oscillations. So think about instead of neutrino triplets, you now think about photon and axion as a triplet, and there's a conversion happening as it propagates. So let's talk, come to the signatures of this particular conversion. So what I told you is that to do a conversion of the resonant kind, it happens when the photon mass in the plasma equals the axion mass. Photon mass in the plasma is decided by, decided by the electron density. So in a, in a cluster, the electron density is fluctuating and but it's typically given by a modified beta model, which I'm showing you here in the left, left, top, left plot, top left plot in red. And if you calculate that what is the corresponding mass regions for which you can expect axion signals to get converted, that's the one in, shown in below. You can see that you can convert from something like 10 to minus uh, 11 to 10 to minus 14 electron volt mass range. So the mass range which you can, pro which you can probe using axion like, uh, using clusters are basically decided by the electron density in the cluster. And as the electron density is high at near the cluster core, so you expect to convert higher axion masses in the core of the cluster shown in this cartoon diagram than in the uh, outskirts of the core where the electron density of the cluster is less. So you can expect lower axion mass to get converted. That means if I give you a cluster, you see this axion signature, the radius at which this conversion happens is a, is a probe to the axion mass. How about the signal strength? When you calculate the corresponding probability of conversion from photon to axion in the presence of its fluctuating magnetic field and electron density, you see that the, for this typical masses from 45 times 10 to minus 14 electron volt to something like 12 times 10 to minus 14 electron volt with a coupling strength shown by, uh, uh, in, uh, mentioned over here, about 10, 10 to minus 13 GeV inverse, which is currently allowed by cast we see that one can get a something like tens of nano Kelvin to a few nano Kelvin signature of distortion in the cosmic microwave background as a function of radius. So let's now ask how different is this particular distortion in comparison to the other known signatures we have in the sky? Let's say cosmic microwave background shown in left, shown in black, synchrotron shown in magenta, uh, y distortion uh, shown in uh, purple and the axion distortion, the polarized one, uh, let's focus on the red one for timing, is the one which is shown in red, dash dot curve. You can see that it is pretty close to the CMB one, unfortunately, so we need, we, but at the low frequency, there is a room to distinguish them if you have a good ILC method or a method of foreground cleaning, which we have also developed in one of our papers. So taking into account all these aspects, the frequency spectrum part, we can ask how well we can uh, estimate the signal, clean these foregrounds and ask how the signal will look. So that's the signal you are looking at, a simulated signal around a galaxy cluster, including the fluctuations in the electron density and in the magnetic field, uh, at a cluster redshift 0.3 for coupling strength 10 to minus 12 GeV inverts for an axial mass of 10 to minus 13 electron volt. You can see that this is a map of a polarization map, cube polarization map. Around that cluster, you see typical fluctuations. The fluctuations are coming because of the fluctuations in the electron density along every line of sight. And this, uh, uh, this particular distortion strength for these values are typically of the order of um, micro Kelvin. That means if I take uh, with my current experiments, which you are flying or ongoing, uh, which can target to measure something like tens of nano Kelvin polarization signature, 
like Simon's Observatory or, CMB, or Simon's CMBS4 in future light world, this is a promising aspect to look for. So we can now ask how the signal looks if we, there is no distortion. So there's a map of the signal in presence of axion distortion and in absence of axion distortion, and you can see the difference. So that's the particular thing you should look for. It has two particular features. It has a very different spatial profile, and it also has a very different spectral profile. And you can include both spatial and spectral informations to distinguish axion-like distortion from other distortions such as CMB or Sunya's uh, bridge effect or uh, synchrotron dust. So let's now talk about measurability. How well can you do this? Five minutes left. Perfect, thank you. So we are really lucky that we are currently ha having a lot of interesting CMB experiments coming, which are particularly going to focus uh, and, uh, with a very high resolution, large sky coverage, and with a lot of frequency channels. That's the key. And also, some uh, like Simon's Observatory and CMB S4 is going to have very high angular resolution. So we are going to detect several galaxy clusters. And with this, let us ask how well we can measure this in the future with the future experiments. With the high resolution CMB experiments, such as CMB S4, uh, Simon's Observatory, and now basically ACTPOD and uh, SPT, we are going to have a large number of galaxy clusters we are going to detect. Something like 1,000, which was there five years back, about 5,000 we are currently from ACTPOL. And in five to 10 years from now, we are going to hit like 10 to four to 10 to five number of galaxy clusters. It's like an excellent time to do search for axions from high resolution polarization maps. And that's the prediction you are now looking at, at the coupling measure, measurability of the coupling strength. G12 means in units of 10 to minus 12 GeV inverse as a function of axion mass in the x-axis from 10 to minus 14 to a few times 10 to minus 11 electron volt. The region which is, which is uh, marked in cyan in the left-hand side is a region which is far from galaxy cluster where we do not have a good understanding of magnetic field at present, or it can be extended in future. The right-hand side, the dark region is the place where I am limited by the angular resolution of CMB experiment. To measure, I need to resolve the galaxy cluster, then only I can measure the distortion. And that sets the wall for me. So that's the right-hand side. And you can see that we can now probe anything below 10 to minus 12 GV electron volt axions via a completely new window, basically looking for polarized spectral distortion around galaxy clusters. That's the first you should look for. And how this compares with all other experiment, all other experiments? So here I'm showing you the bounds available from CAST, supernova 1987A, coma cluster X-ray measurement, and NGC 1275 in black, and the measurability by our new avenue in red for Simon's Observatory, CMB S4, and CMB HD. What you can see is that, the, so this is for a particular mass. As a function of mass, the strength will change, but uh, that I've already shown in this plot. So you can see now that we are going to make a few orders of magnitude improvement in the measurability of the coupling strength of photon to axion in near future. Please remember this aspect is never probed uh, uh, by any other experiments. So these are our current setup where we can measure axion-like particles before our method was proposed. And with our method, we have now op opened completely two new windows to detect axion from resonant conversion over this uh, orange region I talked today. Milky Way, you can also do from Milky Way. We didn't talk about this today. It is possible from light bulb and also from voids. So with this, I will end my talk with three brief summary that one can look for axions using CMB as a backlight. Conversion of CMB photons into apps can produce a new kind of distortion. The distortion is going to be polarized and will be measured around galaxy clusters. Upcoming CMB experiments is going to discover new parameter space of photon axion coupling and the axion mass, which cannot be explored by any other cosmological probes. So with these, I will end my talk and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was brilliant. Let's give uh, Shuri Bernard with a round of applause. Thank you. And uh, I think we already have a question by Kaz. Yes, yes, Rodi. Thank you very much for nice talk. Hi, and 
actually, the, such a conversion depends on the configuration of magnetic field, right? Right. And the, uh, I'm worried about the configuration of the magnetic field inside the cluster of galaxies. I, I, I thought the magnetic field is located and associated with galaxies, not the four cluster of galaxies. So uh, it depends on your assumption, right? Right, so let us take, take a, about a, a one step back and ask, how do we model the magnetic field? So in our paper, That's we have point. modeled the magnetic field from observations of synchrotron and Faraday. So we have it's taken- It's only for galaxy, for galaxy the, clusters. Single galaxy, galaxy clusters. Cluster, clusters. Yes, so there are a couple of galaxy clusters people have measured, and this is going to be come more doable with SKA in future. With right now, mm -hmm. with the uh, in la last decade, we had a couple of galaxy clusters from which we can measure the magnetic field using Faraday and synchrotron. And we have used mm -hmm. that model. But let me, you have, tried, you have uh, touched a very important point, which is very interesting. So let me focus on that a bit. You, you mentioned that the configuration of magnetic field is indeed impo is important, and it is indeed the case. So what really right. dictates the fact? The fact is, when you're doing, uh, when you're calculating the resonant conversion, you are calculating the landau formula. So you are asking, landau mm -hmm. So you are saying, uh, at the place where I have resonant conversion happening, how fast my electron density and my magnetic field is changing. So what mm -hmm. we see is that the typical scale over which resonant conversion is happening is very small, is of few parsec scales or 200 parsec scale. And in that scale, mm -hmm. the magnetic field is not changing abruptly. Right. You get a kick in the signature of resonant conversion and you keep it in some other direction, the magnetic field is going to be different. So you're going to have different kind of polarized distortion. So you, you get some kind of depolarization, but still you remain a polarized mm -hmm. signature around galaxy clusters. Well, a new point, in neutron oscillation, MSW, we know, Lambda zena is good to express the density density profile, but the, yeah, in yeah, you said the yeah galaxy clusters in magnetic field would be different. So yeah, it's yes. a very new point. Thank, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you can <laughs> read our paper on Milky Way, where we actually focused, did a full three D differential equation calculation to take into account the perturbations in electron density and propagated the photon trajectories to show that how does resonant conversion actually gets the kick in a nearby region where the resonant conversion is happening. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can take uh, another question from Mathieu if it's very short. Uh, okay, so thank you for this uh, interesting topic. Um, uh, you have shown that uh, uh, the polarized action spectral signature is very close to, to that of the CMB yeah. uh, uh, anisotropies, it's, it said. And uh, so, I am, so, so you have to observe mainly at low frequency uh, if you want to, to distinguish them, but I am worried that because of this spectral degeneracy, uh, you, you might have a, a large cosmic variance from the CMB in your, in your, um, yes, and uh, yes, yeah. you are right. So let, so yeah, please finish your question, then I'll answer. Yeah. And, uh, uh, uh so I, wa I was wondering, oh, 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 you, oh, you, or, or you manage to fight this cosmic variance, uh, or would you, for example, cross correlate with a, a cluster map? Uh, uh, that's a possibility that we didn't do, but that's a good possibility. But what I do is, thanks to still damping at large scales, large L values. So what do you do when you go to the polarization map? You see the CMB in the E mode is significantly damped. Right. Yeah. So you. That's why the key is you use both spectral and spatial information. So what happens for resonant conversion, it starts to peak around the edge of the uh, galaxy cluster, okay? And mm -hmm. it's a very different spatial, spatial profile. Whereas when you go to CMB at small scale, CMB is significantly damned, the polarization map. So right. we but take but do you know, the, the prof you, you know in advance the, the size of the, of the profile? Yeah, you, so the size of the profile is like a resonator for you. So if you tell me at what axion mass you are looking for, in okay. which range of redshift, you basically have a co-moving radius at which the conversion is happening. You put it back at different radiuses with the angular diameter distance. So you have a, a corresponding theta and you look for a function of theta this signal at different redshift. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much for the interesting I have questions. To...
Thanks. That is short, I'm sorry. But um, thank, you, uh, thank you very much for your talk uh, again. And uh, now it's uh, the turn of uh, Sandeep Pacharia. If, if you can, yeah, you're going to talk about who's going to talk about theoretical and numerical aspects of uh, CMB spectral distortion from non thermal energy injection. Please, you have 15 minutes. Okay, okay. I thank the organizers for the opportunity. So I'll talk about some theoretical and numerical aspect of CMB spectral distortion from non-thermal energy injection. So here is a brief outline. So I will talk about, uh, I will give a brief overview of Companies equation. And I will talk about uh, improvements over Companies equation from using exact competent kernel. I will also talk about uh, some improved poker plank approximation and their limitation, and I will end with some application of these ideas to CMB spectral distortion. So what is company's equation? So company's equation is basically the evolu evolution equation of photon in contact with the thermal electron bath. So this equation is written in here in red. So N is what is called an occupation number and you can convert into number density or energy density given by this formula. X is what is called a dimensionless frequency, which is the omega over theta e. Theta e is basically electron temperature. Uh, tau is what is called an optical depth, which is a product of uh, uh, Compton cross section and electron density and the path length. So in the components equation, uh, we assume that the uh, scattering between electron and photon is given by Thompson cross section, which is just the non relativistic limit of Compton scattering. So basically this equation only talks about non-relativistic, uh, uh, assumes that the uh, uh, interaction between the photons and the thermal electrons is uh, non-relativistic. And uh, so if you see in this equation, there are two terms in the bracket. So one is a derivative term, which captures uh, what is called an Compton boosting. Basically the electron can actually boost the CMB photons, uh, any photons to basically higher energy. And the second term is what is called a recoil. So basically the photons can uh, uh, give the uh, give energy back to the electrons. So for the equilibrium, this term has to, these two terms have to balance. And so the thermal equilibrium condition is given by when this term in the bracket is basically zero. So what we can do is basically take a step back and we can write a, a Boltzmann equation for the photon evolution, uh, which is written here. So in this equation, I'm assuming that the uh, scattering between the photon and electron is basically isotropic. So the angle, angular information has been integrated out. So you just see the function of, uh, you can see this is just only function of energy. So in the bracket, uh, so, so this N and N prime is basically uh, electron photon numbers or occupation number at two different frequencies. So basically all the um, kinematics is captured in this uh, factor P. So basically we can, if you can just compute the most correct relativistic uh, kernel, basically we can solve this equation exactly. And there are tools right now available to do that. So basically this, this is called a CS pack, which, uh, which in which you can calculate the fully relativistically correct uh, Compton scattering uh, kernel. And we can, uh, we can go back to the components equation by doing the non-relativistic approximation. So basically in the non-relativistic limit, the energy exchange of photon is basically very small compared to the electron temperature. So we can, if you can just expand this equation in terms of this small parameter, that is delta omega by theta i, we can go back to the components equation. So in this slide, I'm uh, comparing the results obtained from components equation and this exact kernel. So in these plots, I am plotting what is called the moments of the spectrum. So the moments are basically the average quantity of the photon spectrum. So zeroth moment will be the total photon number. So that is basically exactly comes conserved in both components and exact, exact solution. And the first moment is basically the average energy exchange with the electrons. This can be both positive and negative, uh, depending upon the injection, uh, injection frequency, injection energy of the photon. So in this plot, I'm uh, doing the calculation for uh, for X, for photon injection, for a line photon injection at X is equal to 10. So that means I'm injecting a photon, uh, which is at, uh, which is 10, which energy is basically 10 times higher than the electron energy. And in this calculation, I'm assuming the electron temperature to be a constant. 
So theta e in this calculation is basically constant. So in the left panel, I am plotting the first uh, first moment as a function of y. So y is an integral over theta e times d tau. So basically, if I increase y, basically what I am doing is basically taking more and more number scattering. So as you, as you at the photon and electron scatter more number of times, so you get to the thermalization regime and all, all the solution approach to one solution. This is the equilibrium solution where everything, all the solution, all the solution for different temperature uh, approach one, one solution. So in the blue dashed line, I'm plotting the components uh, kernel, components uh, solution. So the comp for the component solution, the first moment and second moment are basically proportional to uh, electron temperature. And in this calculation, I'm uh, I'm doing the calculus in terms of dimensionless frequency. So basically, the factor theta e has, theta e has been scaled out. So for all the temperature, you see just one per per company's equation, company's calculation. But for the exact kernel, you can see that uh, the calculation is a function of temperature. And as you go to higher temperature, basically the thermalization uh, is basically starting to become inefficient because of this Klein Messina correction. And in the second in the right hand side panel, I'm doing the same for the second moment. And the second moment is basically the photon dispersion, which is always positive. And you will see the same features. And at higher y, you get to the get to an equilibrium situation. So the previous slide was about the average quantity of the photon spectrum. And in this slide, I'm showing the snapshot of the photon evolution. So I'm injecting a line photon at x is equal to 50 at about here. And in the left hand side panel, I'm showing the snapshot for uh, using the component solution, component equation, and in the right side using the exact kernel solution. So, so as you can see in the company's uh, case, the spectrum is very smooth because of the diffusion, diffusion approximation. And at about y is equal to 10, basically your solution has, uh, has basically thermalized and approach an equilibrium solution. But for the exact solution, even at y is equal to 10, you see signatures of the Photon injection that is basically you see a sharp feature at this x is equal to 50. So basically, even at y is equal to 10, the exact solution has not thermalized because of this Klein Messina correction at this relativistic energies. Uh, so, next, as a next step, I try to do an improved flow coherent approximation. Basically, I, I demand that I can still write an equation which is very similar to component's equation. But uh, but these coefficient d omega and a omega basically I am free to choose basically these are my false factors which I try for which I want to tune with the exact kernel to get get uh, result similar to my exact kernel solution. So basically, so uh, so the d and a are fudge to match the first and second moment of the kernel e1 and e2. The expression of e1 and e2 are here, and I am plotting the these factors as a function of uh, photon energy for different temperature in this slow panel. And as you go to higher temperature, you start to see very different features because of these relativistic corrections. Uh, one of the issues of this improved focal Planck approximation is basically this doesn't approach to the correct uh, equilibrium solution. Basically, the equilibrium solution with uh, without stimulated scattering is given by this equation. And for the focal Planck for the focal Planck approximation to approach this equilibrium, this uh, the this coefficient helps to satisfy this relation, basically d over a times theta e is equal to one. But in general, this is not the case. So that's why. Uh, so in the right hand side figure, you see that uh, in the left hand side figure, you see that the the d this blue line is basically the component's limit. And for, uh, for uh, and these different lines are basically the ratio of d over a for different temperatures, which uh, which is generally different from one. And in the right hand side figure, you see the equilibrium solution. So this black line is basically what is you obtain from components and exact solution. And all these different red lines is the improved focal plan approximation for different temperatures. So basically, this doesn't capture this doesn't approach the equilibrium solution. Uh, yeah, so in this slide, so I'm doing the same exercise. Basically, I'm plotting the first moment and second moment of this uh, uh, photon spectrum. And I'm comparing all the all the approaches, basically components, jet kernel and poker plan approximation. So this poker plan approximation uh, captures this uh, first and second moment uh, better than the components uh, component solution. But it has the problem that uh, it doesn't approach the equilibrium solution. So basically, it is not. Uh, 
at least for y greater than one, it is uh, it is not uh, usable. And in this slide, I'm showing the snapshots of the photon evolution for, for the improved and exact solution. And you can see that these shapes do not match the exact solution. You have the five minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in the next part, I'm I uh, I'm going I'm going to talk about CMB spectral distortion. So CMB is given by Planck spectrum with the possible distortion at the level of 10 to the minus 5 or lower. Uh, but energy injection below red shift of two times 10 to the six can give rise to CMB spectral distortion. This is because at this at this uh, red shift, basically the photon non-conserving number non-conserving process like Bernstein-Long and double Compton are basically inefficient and the evolution of photon with the background electron is given by the Compton scattering, which is a, a photon number conserving process. So, so, so therefore, the, if you inject some energy and there is no photons to, uh, there are no uh, extra photons to, uh, there are no extra photon injection, then the CMB cannot relax to a Planck spectrum. So let me remind what are the equation of this uh, equation we are solving for CMB spectral distortion. So we are still solving the photon equation that we are doing before. But in this case, my electron temperature is not constant and it is evolving as the photon, uh, as the spectral distortion is evolving. And this, this is the equation which, which is used for the component's uh, solution. And if we want to take into account relativistic correction, this has to be modified and we have modified this equation. Okay, so in this plot, I'm showing the uh, uh, solution for uh, uh, spectral, CMB spectral distortion shape for different energy injection. So in the left-hand side panel, uh, I'm showing for X is equal to 0.1 and in the right-hand side, X is equal to 200. Uh, and I'm injecting energy at a particular red shift, that's at 10,000 10, and 30,000. And just, this is just one time line photon injection. So you can see that the component's uh, solution basically overestimates the, uh, the breadth or the width of the solution. So basically at rates of 10,000, you see quite a big difference between the components and exact solution. But as I go to higher rates, basically the spectral, uh, the CMB spectral distortion basically thermalizes and uh, you don't see any difference. So basically this uh, relativistic, this uh, exact solution uh, predicts some difference at least at, uh, at least at uh, red shift of few ten thousands. Uh, okay, in this slide, so basically in the previous slide, I talked about uh, only line photon injection. We can do the same exercise with uh, line electron injection. So in this plot, I'm just injecting a monochromatic electron and these different energies. And I'm showing the CMB spectral distortion shape. Basically, as I go on increasing the electron energy, so each electron in each scattering can give a, a, a bigger fraction of its energy to photons. So that's why you see the uh, peak of the shape basically start moving to the right. And I'm uh, injecting constant num constant energy for all these cases. And as, as more and more photons are at higher energy, you start to see the dip in this uh, peak of the spectrum. So basically for non-thermal electron injection also, you see basically different shape. And uh, you may expect that as I keep on going, increasing electron energy, this basically you, the intensity basically go keep, keep going downwards and it is basically zero at some uh, MeV uh, electron energy or so. But this is not the case because uh, even these high energy photons will not just sit around. And at these high red shift, the universe is dense enough that these photons can start with the background electrons and and boost the background electrons to some higher energy. And these, these, uh, non uh, these photons, these low energy photons will show up in, in these CMB bands. And these will have some non-thermal shape. So basically, uh, basically CMB, CMB spectral distortion can still probe non-thermal electron inje injection for energy band as high as MEB or GEB scale. So I will conclude with uh, this slide. So for, for relativistic temperature, so that component's equation doesn't capture the evolution of photon spectrum correctly and exact component is required. And we can improve our component's equation for 
component question by using input poker plan approximation, which captures subject average potent spectrum, average quantity of potent spectrum well, but not the exact spectrum of the potents. And these relativistic correction are important to obtain correct CMB spectral distortion for potent injection at a rate shift of say 10 to the power 4. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, let's give him a round of applause. Is there any question? Uh, yeah, Carlo has a question, please. Carlo. Uh, so uh, a question uh -huh. uh, regarding the, the, the solution, particularly I think uh, uh, in the case of the improved focal Planck equation approximation, how you, can you manage the, the boundary condition in, in this case, but in general uh, in your approach? Since uh, at the equilibrium you have uh, 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 one single condition coming from uh, uh, the, the requirement of having a new current or, but in, in the general, how can you manage this? No, I mean, the photon number is conserved already by this one over omega square factor. So basically, if I calculate the photon, photon number, I multiply this equation by omega square, then the expression is basically a total derivative. And if you integrate over, then basically that says my photon number is conserved. And basically, this D and A omega are basically just uh, false parameter to get the first and second moment. So there is no extra boundary condition as such. Maybe I can comment there, uh, Carlo. Um, you, uh, you are to some extent right that there is a, uh, an issue with the boundary condition. So, but what, most of the computation, uh, we literally have no photons at the boundary. So um, we can we can actually even uh, we check this uh, we can even set the photon number uh, photon occupation number to zero essentially at the boundaries and not have any change in the solution until you go to very very long evolution. Um, but the fact that the equilibrium solution is not approached by the reformulated Companitz equation improved for uh, for Kaplan approximation um, th th that has nothing to do with the boundary at the end of the day. So uh, you are right that if one wanted to do this more properly, the boundary condition will probably be at least for long evolutions a problem. But it is it is not a problem that it's already a problem before that. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> the most, of course. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Let's uh, thank uh, Sandeep again. Uh, next up uh, is uh, Hideki Tanimura. Hideki, if you can share your screen. Yes, I share my He's screen. going to speak about the uh, new Planck TSZ maps and its cosmological analysis. And, uh, and, uh, no. ah. You have 10 minutes, you can okay. start whenever you're ready. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so, uh, thank you for. Uh, it is online. Okay. Thank you for giving me opportunity to talk about my work. Uh, I will talk about the new Planck SC map and its cosmological analysis. Uh, my name is Hideki Tanimura. I'm a postdoc working with Nabila Ghanim and uh, Marion Duspi. Uh, motivation of this study is in cosmology, there is a famous uh, SA tension, which is the tension between uh, Planck CMB measurement and also in local uh, and uh, weak ranging measurement and the cluster counting local. And the TSC effect is very sensitive to this S8 parameter, which is a combination of sigma eight and omega matter. So it's a good probe. And another reason is Planck SC map has not been updated since 2015, but there, now there is a good motivation uh, Planck recently re released uh, PR4 data called N pipe maps have uh, a lot of improvement in the temperature maps in terms of calibration and the correction band pass and also increased data. So these uh, systematic and uh, statistical improvement allow to construct better SC map and uh, this will provide uh, unbiased view to cosmological and astrophysical analysis. Just in case, uh, its effect is the distortion of the CMB spectra caused by high energy electron in galaxy clusters. Uh, there is a spe specific characteristic shape, so we can use uh, this spe uh, spectra to extract a C signal. 
Uh, first, we constructed a C map uh, in the same way as the previous 2015. Uh, we constructed a C map with 10 alt minutes and with Milka algorithm. And this is a comparison of the SC map left hand side is new one, our map and the old one on the light. And you see clear difference in the stripe. The level of stripe is uh, significantly reduced in the new SC map. And this is because uh, in the frequency map uh, it's reduced and this improvement uh, propagate into this SC map. And in more detail, we compare uh, the, in the histogram uh, between old and the new SC map. Black one is old one and the new one is red one. And there's the Gaussian part and non-Gaussian part. And the, you know, non-Gaussian part is essentially come from a C signal from galaxy clusters. So we check the signal level using uh, Planck SC clusters using uh, all the SC map and the uh, new SC map uh, signals are consistent. We also check noise uh, with power spectra. And you see uh, the noise uh, uh, in, in our new SC map is uh, lower than the old one in entire scale. And we found uh, noise of our SC map is reduced by roughly 7%. And this is the also in detail, uh, we compare uh, uh, the SC signal from three galaxy clusters. Uh, first using old SC map. And uh, this is the new SC map with the same angular resolution 10 minutes and they are consistent. Uh, we also produce a higher angular resolution SC map, which is all sky of course, uh, 7.5 arc minutes. And if you compare the radial profile uh, here, uh, black and the blue are from 10 arc minutes, they are consistent. But if you look at red line, which is from 7.5 arc minutes, uh, you can better probe uh, a small scale around core. And uh, we also check the signal from diffuse gas using three uh, merging system. Uh, in the uh, basically con uh, uh, conclusions are same. Uh, if uh, if this is the result using the old SC map, and uh, this is the result with new SC map with the same angular resolution of 10 minutes. But if you look at the uh, higher angular resolution, 7.5 arc minutes, you can better probe the uh, small scale so you can see more detailed structures. And now uh, move on from uh, uh, real space to Fourier space for cosmological analysis. Uh, I basically, for the cosmological analysis, we follow the previous Planck analysis in 2015. Uh, they uh, uh, they cross correlate uh, the NIRC, uh, NIRC, sorry, NIRC and Miruka uh, SC map from period one and the period two, which is to avoid a bias induced by the noise if you use out power spectra. We did the same uh, thing. Uh, we made uh, two SC map uh, with Miruka. So we have SC map one, SC map two from period one, from period two, and uh, cross correlated. And this is the result. And the entire scale signals uh, are consistent, but you notice uh, uncertainties are lower, which is probably due to uh, lower noise uh, you see uh, in my slide before, and also minimal survey stripes. And we also optimize our window function to suppress residual foreground emissions. And we use this data and uh, the cosmological analysis. Uh, but first, you find uh, error bars are larger on large scales here. Here, we just include Gaussian error bar. Here, uh, we include uh, non Gaussian part. It's called tri, -scap tri spectrum. Uh, because now, recent analysis. Uh, people including non-Gaussian error bar to be precise. And for the model of this uh, SC map signal, uh, we model this uh, with SC signal plus contamination. For the SC signal, uh, we change the parameter value of omega m and sigma eight, uh, but other parameters are fixed to the uh, Planck CMB results. Uh, because it's uh, basically insensitive to the uh, 
SC signal. And we also include mass bias parameter B. Uh, uh, here we use a, a prior from Canadian cluster comparison project called CCCP. So basically it's 0.2 uh, with some uncertainty. In the three minutes left. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Uh, and the contamination part, there's a CAB and the infrared source and the radio source and noise. We analytically compute the, each component, but there is uncertainty. So we, you, uh, we use analyt our analytical estimate as a template and the changes amplitude. And uh, we, uh, we fit the data with this model. And first we find the amplitude of contamination here is all consistent with one, which means our estimate of uh, contamination is reasonable. And finally, we found uh, the SC signal, best SC signal in red line. And uh, it is dominant from large scale to uh, uh, L of 600. And now we have our best SC model, uh, which is uh, red line with error bar. Uh, first, we compare this with uh, uh, old results from Planck. Uh, 2015, which is black dashed line, which is uh, consistent. We also compare our SC model with the ACT and recent SPT uh, result here, which is slightly lower uh, uh, than our values, but now it's still uh, it's consistent uh, within two sigma. And we also have cosmological parameter estimate and here, uh, this is uh, 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 our estimate in uh, sigma eight omega m frame. And first you see a slight tension uh, uh, with Frank CMB measurement and also lensing measurement from the desk and kits. And our result is this red banana, uh, which is pretty much consistent with uh, lensing, weak lensing measurement which is also shown in this S8 parameter estimate. This is uh, our estimate and this is Frank and lensing it here. Finally, uh, we check the systematics in our cosmological analysis. Uh, we use a prior for mass bias and uh, our fiducial prior, CCCP prior, uh, we use this value. We also change this prior to uh, uh, a different weak lensing measurement or also result from hydro simulation. And this is the impact. And we also change uh, our uh, pressure profile model. We use a uh, universal pressure profile from pr Planck 2013 uh, uh, measured with XM Newton and Planck. But we also change this model to uh, X-ray based measurement, also SC only based measurement, uh, including ACT. Uh, this is the impact. And we increase this impact in the systematic uncertainty. And this is the result of our SA value. And this value is now consistent with Planck CMB result uh, here in within two sigma. And I finish uh, summary and uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Is there any question? Uh, Mattel, please. Yeah, Mattel. sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, I had a quick question. So if you uh, incorporate the data points from the South Pole Telescope and ACT uh, in your data, like yeah. in your fit, uh, okay. would that, yeah, exactly. If, you, if let's say you, added those data points in your fit, would that make your measurement more consistent with Planck or, or move it in the wrong direction? Uh, I think if I, in, I didn't check it clearly, but I think it doesn't change so much uh, because of the uncertainty. Actually, our measurement is basically dominant around this area and the uncertainty is uh, basically lower than uh, SPT and ACT. So maybe even if I include ACT and SPT, uh, our result doesn't change. So, okay, m maybe if, if there is no other qu pressing question, I can try to phrase my question another way. So okay. between Planck 2015 and Planck 2020, there is a sort of different tilt 
of the spectrum. Yeah. Okay. And if you include uh, ACT okay. and SPT, the tilt changes even more. So I was wondering whether yeah. this difference in tilt makes the measurement more compatible with uh, early time measurement, like inference or, uh, or less. Uh... Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. I, okay. I'm not clearly sure about this tilt. Maybe I should check more details. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. Yeah. Uh, we are running a tiny bit later. So, I will skip to the next talk. And maybe if we have time, we can ask more questions uh, in the end. Uh, hope, uh, yeah, Mathieu doesn't, doesn't mind. Uh, so if you can stop okay. share uh, your yeah. screen, Zeki. Yeah. Thank you very much yeah. again. Thank you. Uh, like uh, next speaker is gonna be um, Sunil Malik, who's gonna talk about the implications of magnetic fields uh, on uh, IgM temperature and TSZ effect in presence of uh, barium dark matter interaction. Uh, I have uh, wait the screen share stopped. Can you? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's great. You have ten minutes, please. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Thank you everyone uh, for uh, coming. And thank you organizer for giving me the time to, for presenting my work. So uh, I'm Sunil Malik, presenting a uh, postdoc at IIT Bombay. So I'm presenting a work with, which I've done in my PhD where we have tried to uh, include the magnetic field in the calculation or, of the IGM temperature and where we are propagating this effect into the thermal jet just that effect and we also shared the baryonic dark interaction so now uh, for the completeness uh, we let me give the the, the uh, basic introductions so the the igm temp, the plasma in igms and galaxy clusters affect the cmb and it uh, dis distorts the spectrum and it's mainly quantified by the the compton y parameters and which depend upon the ionization fractions and the the baryonic temperature so if you under, uh, want to understand the cosmic magnetism the magnetic field effect on this thermal effect and the IGM temperature. So we need to volutions with and without one. So how now the question is how magnetic field can affect the IGM uh, and and the brandy content. So it can uh, situations. Uh, we are uh, considering only the Z is equal to ten, up to ten only. So where the 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 structure formations are not uh, coming to picture, but the magnetic heating via ambipolar and magnetic heating via magnet, uh, magnetic turbulence decay can affect the system. So now uh, let's see that what are the equations, how the thermal and ionization uh, states evolve. So here I, I have divided the, the temperature equation into five part. So the, the this second and the fourth part will get affected because of the magnetic field and where uh, the density fluctuations uh, uh, will get a bit modified if you consider the magnetic field and then tau heat will which has come from the ambipolar and turbulent. And then the ionization uh, part has three uh, uh, usual contributions. So now in standard scenario, people uh, generally avoid the, the no background fluctuations and no magnetic heating. But in our case, we consider this, uh, these two contributions uh, by assuming the statical homogeneous and isotropic magnetic field and, and where the magnetic power spectrum uh, is considered uh, using in this uh, equations, uh, k to the power nb. So we have considered the magnetic parameter in a wide range uh, from very small magnetic field to the three nanogauss magnetic field. And the spectral index is also ranging from zero to my uh, uh, spectral invariant uh, in uh, minus 2.9. And uh, we have taken the, the two uh, averaging length scale. So by taking these uh, characteristics of the magnetic field, we have evolved the, uh, the equations and then look at the baryonic temperature evolutions. So here we have taken uh, all the possible combination of the magnetic field strength parameters and averaging scale and uh, by turning off and on the, by this effect of MB and turbulent and for the comparisons we uh, we can see we can, we see that for the three nano goals uh, uh, and nb minus 2.9 by considering both the contributions the magnetic uh, the, the temperature of the baryon is uh, uh, enhanced considerably and which is in uh, roughly in agreement with 
Chulu Bar 2015, where the parameter were the same, but uh, the density fluctuations uh, has has been not been considered. Uh, so, but the, the, the more or less both the in the later part the Brunei temperature is a bit higher than the which has been uh, obtained by the in the earlier studies. So similarly, in the ionization fractions, the ionization fractions uh, also uh, get modified at least four time. So both the, the bryonic temperature and the ionization fractions uh, contribution will also uh, propagate to the Y parameter. So now let me so evolution of the Y parameter in presence of the magnetic field. So here we can see that this black dotted line is in the standard, uh, the, the Y parameter evolution. Here uh, we have plotted the mode Y versus Z. So uh, the, this, this black dotted dashed line is the, the standard scenario. If we consider the magnet field, then and, and as we see that the, it has impact on the bryonic as well as the ionization fraction, uh, the component so it will get modified and the uh, ultimately the we have the 10 to the power minus 12 uh, order of at redshift of 10 uh, y parameter is there so uh, there is a considerably two order of enhancement if we consider the magnetic field uh, uh, effects uh, via these uh, ampipolars and density fluctuations and the magnetic turbulence decay so now if we uh, add the non-standard uh, dark matter bionic interactions uh, into the this uh, calculations, then the bionic temperature equation get modified. So now there is an additional term uh, in the, in these equations, which uh, which uh, which can affect the evolution of the bionic temperature. So here we have considered this uh, bionic dark matter uh, interactions of uh, uh, which is proportional to the power of n and here we have shown the result for n equal to minus 4 but in our calculation we have checked for n equal to minus 2 and minus 1 other scenario as well but the contribution was not that much visible so here uh, if in this case the the uh, this dq by dt term uh, can have the two terms one is if both these fluids the dark matter and the brion have two different temperatures. So the first term will have this uh, heat exchange between these two fluids via this term the, because of the temperature difference and which is proportional to the temperature difference and there's a, uh, uh, this, gam this gamma factor which depend upon the dark matter mass and uh, other property of the uh, dark matter. So then now there is a second term which is a drag term because these two fluids uh, in, from the initial uh, from red shift 1100 they can have two different velocities because of the this drag force between these two fluids the, there can be a heat exchange which depend upon this uh, relative velocity uh, term in uh, uh, as i saw in, in this equations so if we consider this uh, this term into the veronic uh, temperature equations uh, the ionization equations won't get directly affected uh, but it the, the, because of the coupling, the, the ionization fraction can also have impact. But by taking the dark, dark matter mass range of uh, 0 0.1 to 1 GV range uh, with course this sigma, the we, we looked at the evolution of the, the bryonic temperature as well as the dark matter temperature. So if you see this, uh, the black line, which is a standard uh, bryonic temperature evolution line, and, and this red, line, uh, red solid line is in the bryonic temperature in case of uh, the, this bryon and DM interaction is on. So now the, uh, it is uh, withdrawing the heat from the bryon. Uh, which is not uh, where the magnetic field is considered to be very small. So it is 0 0.003. So magnetic heating is not playing much role here. So now it seems that the, this heating is uh, at n equal to minus four is drawing the heat, but not causing much effect to the, uh, if we consider the field into picture, which is also visible from the dark matter temperature evolution. Here, uh, this, this is the dark matter temperatures uh, evolutions. So the dark matter temperature get announced and later on because of the expansion or decrease in density, uh, the, so the interaction rate become less, so it is decreasing. And it do, the, the top line with which, which this, uh, the green uh, line, this is the again that uh, the the TB the bryon temperature plot in case of three nanogos. So it is not getting affected much uh, if we consider this high magnetic field contributions. So the bryonic dark matter interaction uh, effect gets suppressed if we uh, if we are putting the heat or the, the energy from the magnetic field. Now same. Uh, okay, so, so you so have two minutes. 
So uh, uh, now we plot the uh, the the mode y again. So which which is uh, not uh, the stint, the the stop line is again the same for the three nano goes. It is not. It is still around ten to the power minus twelve. It is not getting affected. But uh, this uh, the blue solid line, which was for the where the TB was uh, beyond temperature, uh, getting affected because of the interactions. So it is going below the standard one. And uh, we here uh, this kink is because the in in one case the the T, uh, TB can be below the CMB and then there because of the uh, log plots so, so there will be a uh, the zero terms and then there is a kink so uh, the final conclusion is so magnetic field uh, do significantly affect the the ts that effect and ionization fractions also gets four time uh, than standard one if you consider considerably higher magnetic field but the bryonic dark matter interactions uh, do not have much affected uh, uh, on the y parameter result or the thermal and ionization fractions yeah thank you That's okay thank you very much very very nice talk is there any question uh, so okay no, Kaz, I saw your hand flashing at some point, but maybe maybe the answer is it. <laughs> yeah, right. But I, I gave up, but uh, because there was no time. Yeah. Okay. The you assume the dark matter energy is um, velocity is zero, right? And but uh, only through the the interaction, the, the temperature, dark matter has a temperature. But the uh, uh, yeah. I, and, and we know n equal minus one has a strong strong motivation to study because of the Coulomb interaction. But uh, if you change it from yeah. minus two or something, then yeah, does it affect? I think it may affect the the current direct detection of dark matter. Do you, you think so? So uh, at least in this case. Yeah. So uh, in this case, we have checked the uh, evolution with the n to min minus four, but uh, we were uh, having the, the effect, maybe because of the DM mass range and the sigma uh, that we are considered, uh, which was not uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the same range, which was which we should consider in n to, n to the power minus four, two or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, maybe you are right. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sunil, and uh, thanks uh, for the nice talk. Again, next up is going to be Ogan Nozoi talking about the CMB mu t cross correlation as a probe of uh, primordial black holes uh, scenarios. You have uh, 15 minutes. I'm going to give you a warning after. Uh, sorry, I mean, when five minutes are left. Feel free to start whenever you're ready. I cannot hear you. I think you're muted, maybe. Ogan, I can you please unmute yourself? Sorry, I am okay. doing it again. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I would like to thank to the organizers, Andrea and Jens, for the invitation and giving me the chance to do, present my work. So I'm going to be talking about the recent work uh, done in collaboration with Giamma Svetosinato, and I will be focusing on um, CMB uh, uh, mu distortions in correlation with uh, temperature anisotropies as a probe of inflationary scenarios that can produce promoted black holes. So um, much of the recent work in this context uh, has been focused on the, um, the physics on the peak scale of the power spectrum. For example, we recently run that the promoted black hole abundance is sensitive to the shape of the power spectrum around its peak. In some cases, this might require some non perturbative treatment. We also learned that the non-gaussianity intrinsic and, and model-dependent non-gaussianity in these scenarios can also influence the promoted black hole abundance. There are also some interesting theoretical considerations about the quantum diffusion around the peak scale that might affect uh, our predictions about the promoted black hole abundance. But uh, considering all these features in this talk, I will uh, focus on um, uh, 
on scales much larger than the peak scale and ask the questions, can, can we probe the promoted black hole formation mechanism by focusing on larger scales, well away from the peak scale? And I, in this context, I will identify a universal feature that might be present in these scenarios that, might, uh, that, may, that may allow us to do so. Uh, so to uh, briefly review the, the mechanism that can generate this large peaks in the, in the power spectrum during inflation, uh, here I'm showing you the equation of motion for the curvature perturbation, and on large scales we can uh, write down its solutions organized in this form, where we have this constant term, and the second term is just the usual decaying term parameterized by an integral of the pump field. And the pump field can be described by this simple relation, which is depend on the, the, the second slow roll parameter during inflation. So looking at the form of the solution, it actually gives us a clue how we can amplify the, the curvature perturbation. For example, if we have a non-attractive solution that violates slow roll during inflation with eta is less than minus two, we can have a decaying pump field in a way that we can actually resurrect these decaying modes. And the same thing actually is also valid if you can write down some k-square corrections to this solution. And this way we can amplify the, the curvature perturbation. And the crit crucial point is that this is a supervising process. It happens when the modes are uh, supervising. So given that it's a supervising process, we should be able to characterize it as a wave number expansion. And this is precisely what uh, the gradient expansion formalism that is first introduced by Legion et al. does. And this, in this framework, we can relate the late time curvature perturbation to its valley at around horizon crossing, simply in terms of a complex coefficient alpha k, which depends on, uh, which can be organized in a k expansion. And the coefficients of these expansion are actually some nested integrals of the pump field that can be shown. And exactly in promoted black hole forming scenarios where we have a decaying pump field in a transient way, we can, we can make these functions large in a way to enhance this complex coefficient so that we can enhance the curvature perturbation. So to, to, to make analytic progress, we can simply assume a two-phase model. Let's say we have a slow roll phase uh, followed by a non-slow roll phase or an unattractive phase parameterized by a negative large eta, eta c that I'm calling here. And these phases are connected at some time tau zero. And in this way, the growth can be characterized simply in terms of two numbers, uh, namely the duration of the non-attractive error and the value of the slow roll parameter in this error. And using these analytic formulas, we can actually make nice plots about the power spectrum and understand its global shape as we move from large scales to small scales. And for modes that exit during the slow roll era, there is actually this characteristic dip feature in the power, which happens at some critical wave number, followed by a large growth on towards the smaller scales and the power spectrum reaches its peak value, which happens for modes that exit during the non-slow roll era. And using these analytic expressions, we can also find some robust relations between the peak scale and dip scale, which is related by uh, this expression. And the ratio is about 100, and which is virtually present in every model that has been considered in the literature. We can also go ahead and also calculate the bispectrum uh, using this uh, analytic formulas. And for example, I'm showing you here the squeeze limit of the nonlinear parameter especially around the dip feature, which has this characteristic dependence. It can increase around the dip feature. And what I would like to focus in this talk is to assume that this dip feature is actually corresponds to this mu era, a choice that I will actually make uh, a bit clearer in the next slide when I uh, briefly review the mu distortions. Oops. So we know that energy injection caused by the silt damping of acoustic waves in the pre-recombination plasma heats photons and leads to chemical potential type uh, distortions in the black body uh, uh, spectrum of the CMB photons. Since the initial conditions for this energy injection process are set on supervised scales, this makes actually me distortions as a powerful probe of uh, primordial physics. And namely, the average mu distortion can be, uh, can be sensitive to the integral of the power spectrum, where this KD here is just a damping scale of photons, which is a redshift dependent quantity. So if we consider a scenario where the peak of the power spectrum actually lies in the uh, um, scales associated with the mu area, which is between 10 to 10 to the four inverse megaparsec, 
we would already have quite stringent constraints on such a scenario. And even the constraints from Cobb and fires would not allow to produce as too much primordial black hole. So in, this is why in, in this talk, I will focus on a, on a case where the dip feature actually lies in this mu era and such that the peak is away from it so that we can avoid the constraints from the mu distortions alone. Um, so in this case, um, um, a nice observable is the cross correlations between mu distortions and temperature anisotropies, which are shown to be actually sensitive to, sensitive to the promotive bispectrum in the isocellus configuration. And interestingly, such an observable is actually can allow us to access more squeeze configurations of, of the primordial line gas entity compared to the temperature anisotropies alone. For example, the large uh, momentum, the small momentum ratio, which is which I denote my k, can be as large as 10 to the 8 uh, uh, in this observable. And comparing with the with temperature anisotropies alone, which uh, we can only reach uh, this ratio to be at most uh, around 1,000. So what I will do in this talk is that uh, by using these analytic formulas, we can actually write down an analytic formulas for the bispectrum around the dip feature, which can be actually recast in a form that resembles very much the local form bispectrum, where only in this case, we have some scale dependent effective nonlinear parameter. And we parameterize it in such a way that this non, uh, that this scale depending on uh, effective nonlinear parameter actually reduces to some primordial FNL on the very large scale tail of the squeeze limit, such that it reduces to some primordial uh, FNL. I'm doing this to keep track of to relate the resulting uh, CL mu t, the cross correlations to uh, some primordial um, FNL that, that might be present at, at CMB scales, at very large scales. So here are our results. Um, essentially, you can do this calculation analytically and show that the, the cross correlations between mu and t is basically sensitive to the, the combination of these parameters, which is the primordial quantity plus on large scales, plus this B parameter that parameterizes actually the scale dependence of this uh, non-gastinity around the dip feature, given by this integral uh, over um, uh, small, uh, large, small momenta and the large momenta in the squeeze limit. Um, so, so in, in principle, in promoter black hole scenarios, this this B parameter can take contributions in in different ways. First of all, due to its non-trivial dependence on the small momenta, it can its its size can increase through this integral, as well as if it depends on the small momenta. Uh, it's 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 um, multiple dependence can also change. We found that actually in this in the squeeze limit at leading order, this is not the case. So it, it can uh, the, this nonlinear parameter can be only uh, described in terms of the large momenta, which actually depends on the location of the deep feature, as well as the properties of the non-attractor non-slow roll error. So here I'm showing you the results in a promoted black hole scenario compared to a local bispectrum. In principle, it, it gets some large negative contribution on very large scales, and which makes these uh, mu and temperature anisotropies anti-correlated at large scales. And it takes the characteristic scale dependence that is actually not very different from the local bispectrum, only in this case that the, the resulting cross correlations are just inverted. And here the results are uh, shown by the red dashed is just a result from that can that one might obtain from the Zax Wolf limit, in which case we can just write down the transfer function of temperature and isotropies in this uh, simple form. So the overall result is that the the the, the shape of this uh, the cross correlations are inverted and its overall amplitude is actually can be enhanced compared to a pure local bispectrum. And it, the result that I'm showing you here is, is for a dip scale, dip scale that is corresponds to 10 to the three inverse megaparsec, which lies between the uh, uh, scales associated with the mu era, which is between 10 to 10 to the four inverse megaparsec. And the reason for this negativity anti-correlation at large scales is, uh, can be understood by looking at this B parameter in the zax wolf limit, which can be calculated analytically using our, uh, the formulas that we developed. 
And we see that if for, for a small range of uh, dip scales, it can obtain large uh, negative values in the negative direction, which gives its, uh, which, which is the reason that these cross correlations are negative. But on small scales, the temperature, the evolution of temperature uh, anisotropies changes its sign and it becomes, uh, the cross correlation becomes correlated between uh, mu and uh, t. Okay. You have four minutes left. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we also made to, to assess the detectability of the signal, we made a simple signal to noise ratio analysis following nice papers by Jens. Um, and uh, this is the result that we obtained. And in principle, one can put a bound on the, the, the combination of these two parameters that I showed you earlier uh, for the observability. And considering, um, for example, a local Langaciante of order one, from these expressions, one can see that the, uh, both signals uh, for both uh, uh, experiments like Pixie or Prism, this, this, uh, this feature should be observable. But in the, in the feature, if we can uh, constrain the promodular Lagassianity associated with the CMB scales to a percent level, this is probably will not be the case. So what are the implications? So in, as, as you can see from the right-hand side plot is that the effects that we are after that, uh, that is introduced by the scale dependence of the bispectrum can only be relevant for a small range of dip scales. So it's, it's between around 1000 to 10 to the four only. And at, at very large, at, at, at very small scales, uh, uh, the effect actually goes away. So considering this robust relation between the peak scale and the, and the, and the, uh, and the dip scale, uh, we can infer that, that this, this, these effects are only relevant uh, for a small range of masses of promoter black holes, from solar mass to 100 solar mass, if you're optimistic. Maybe interestingly, these type of black holes can be also considered as uh, seeds of supermassive black holes if we are optimistic about the accretion and merger effects after their formation. Okay, so this is it basically, and these are my conclusions. So we showed that the, the squeeze Langassianti present around the dip feature in promoting uh, black hole generating scenarios might lead to an observable cross correlations between uh, mu distortions and temperature anisotropies. And this is relevant for promoter black hole masses that are larger than the solar mass between one to 100 solar masses. And in this context, this, this cross correlations can be considered as an independent observable induced on much larger scales than the peak scale associated with the promoter black hole production. Um, uh, also, it can be utilized to distinguish between astrophysical or primordial origin of black holes because precisely this effect is relevant for black holes larger than the solar mass. On the other hand, it can be also utilized as a tool for model comparison because some models in the literature does not have, does not contain this deep feature uh, in, the, in the power spectrum. And as well as it's not gonna be there for the bispectrum. So as for the outlook, um, uh, we also, uh, actually found that the bispectrum has also support for a collateral configurations, although we only focused on the squeeze configurations. So the corresponding uh, predictions on the, the cross correlations can be carried, that could be interesting. Another research venue for the future can be that the, one can look at the expected cross correlations for scenarios that can generate uh, a stochastic gravitational wave background of induced origin via these large fluctuations. And considering the relevant promoter black hole masses that I showed here, uh, this should be uh, relevant for um, uh, missions like uh, that can generate gravitational wave background at, at uh, SKA scales, for example. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Uh, is there any question? Uh, Kaz again, please. Yes, yeah, actually the, yeah, the observation, future observation of immune peak correlation is a very nice idea. And I know the Eiichiro Komatsu did a pioneering work. And I, I, I really appreciate the direction of this kind of research. But I just uh, one comment about the, the ultra slow. Yeah, already I saw this, this thing over, right? Yeah. I, I think it's uh, overly, you know, uh, advertised the importance of ultra slow observation by my friend, Juan Galicia and uh, Sebastian Crest, or when you flew and uh, yeah, Sam Pasaguria. Uh, I think the, it's really the only single field in fact, or really single field, then it's very difficult to reach the. Or the one 
perturbation at small scale. But the, if we consider the learning, of, learning or learning or learning, large positive learning or learning, then it's easy to reach the order one at small scale. But the, we know it's not a really single field inflation, it's a smart field. The hybrid inflation those is possible, but that uh, might, might be classified into yeah, multi-field inflation. But that, yeah, it's not so easy to be the So you're saying that it's, it's hard to produce a peak uh, in, in single field inflation. Of course, of course. It's, it's of course. finely tuned as well. That's, I agree completely. No, everything is fine, finely tuned. Yeah. To, yeah. to match the you know, K, K, wave number K, right? So it's everything we have to. Yeah, tune it. No natural inflation model, but uh, it's possible uh, e even in hybrid inflation. So it, uh, we, we don't have to stick to the rootless order inflation so much. I think it's a very problem in the community. It's a, just a prejudice, I think. That is it's true. I agree completely. Study. Actually, incredibly yeah. finely tuned. I also explored some axion inflation scenarios, which I find actually a bit more realistic, I would say. <laughs> Where you have some particle no, I don't production. Know, but, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Not so specific to the axial inflation, but uh, no, okay, just my, one comment about the ultra slow inflation. Okay, sure. Maybe, maybe we'll further the discussion uh, in the next session uh, during the discussion. Um, the, the time allocated for the discussion. Uh, I will quickly move uh, to Matteo Mezaia's talk. Um, which title is uh, cross correlation between uh, CMB polarization and mu distortion and isotropies. Uh, and uh, yeah, Mathieu, you have the stage, uh, 15 minutes, please. I'm, Mathieu, I cannot- Yeah, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, okay, now it's good. Uh, okay. It's, uh, I should uh, do this maybe. Okay, uh, so thanks. Uh, yeah, I would like to talk about uh, uh, cross correlation between new distortion anisotropies and CMB polarization. This is a follow up work uh, of an earlier paper with uh, Jens Kuba, and this follow up work is in collaboration with Andrea Raveni and Jens Kuba. Uh, here, I would like to, to show you uh, that we might uh, detect uh, new distortion anisotropies with future measures. Uh, I'm not speaking about spectrometer, CMB imagers, uh, by cross-correlating with CMB anisotropies. And I would like also to show that uh, it can help to constrain primordial non-Gaussianity. And most important, that cross-correlation with CMB polarization, mu E cross-correlations can in fact provide you more constraining power than mu T correlations. Okay, we have seen several mechanisms today that can generate uh, spectral distortions. Uh, and one standard uh, process is the dissipation of small scale acoustic modes of the primordial perturbations, uh, which uh, on CMB anisotropy uh, uh, gives this uh, uh, damping of the anisotropies. Uh, this is just like uh, CMB photons random walking out of uh, overdense hot regions toward underdense cold regions, and thus uniformizing the temperature of the small scale region foremost. And say otherwise, uh, the silk damping is like uh, mixing uh, multiple black bodies of different temperatures at, mo at small scales. And what happens when you mix uh, different black bodies of different temperatures? Uh, you get uh, uh, tiny distortions, mu and y distortion to the CMB black body. Uh, mu distortions happen at early times at redshift uh, beyond 10 to the 4, so behind the last scattering surface at prior combination epochs, while Y distortions happen even in the late universe so soon as the Deutsch effect. And the shape of uh, the distortions compared to the black body spectrum of uh, initial Planck spectrum has been computed uh, through Companitz equations and quantum scattering physics by Sunev and Zeldovich. Uh, we have this exact expression for mu distortions or y distortions. And so the, this distortion have a peculiar shape, uh, which is shown here compared to the CMB uh, black body. And why uh, this distortion can be interesting? They are interesting to probe the primordial power spectrum at very small scales. Uh, you know that uh, wave numbers uh, beyond 0.15 inverse megaparsecs uh, cannot be probed by a CMB anisotropy or large scale structure survey because of uh, the erasing of the perturbations uh, by slick damping on CMB anisotropy. 
and because uh, for uh, LSS, the physics is uh, very nonlinear at small scales. In contrast, uh, CMB spectral distortion, Y and mu, can extend our liver arm up to uh, K of uh, 10 to the 3 inverse megaparsec, while still being a linear physics in a linear regime. So now, aside from average distortions, uh, we may have anisotropies of spectral distortion from uh, non-Gaussian primordial perturbations. Uh, in particular, as uh, it has been said in the previous talks, uh, if you have uh, uh, ultra squeeze configurations of uh, non Gaussianities, uh, the non Gaussian coupling between short and long wavelength modes can modulate sick damping uh, across different uh, directions in the sky, spatial modulation of the damping of primordial perturbations, and so can generate anisotropic mu distortions, and uh, so uh, anisotropies of mu distortion, right? And these non Gaussian couplings. Also, it must generate cross correlation between these mu distortion anisotropies and the CMB temperature anisotropies. And not only mu, but also Y uh, distortion, of course. And why this is uh, interesting? Because uh, by cross correlating with a large CMB temperature anisotropy, you en enhance the distortion signal by looking for this uh, cross power spectrum, cross mu T and Y T power spectrum. And also, uh, this is proportional to the FNL parameter of primordial non Gaussianity at very small scale. And so this offers new pivot scale to probe the scale dependence of primordial non Gaussianity, uh, which is, uh, can be predicted by uh, multi field inflations or modified initial state of inflation. So the theory, the exact shape of this mu T and y T uh, cross spectra has been computed by Andrea in 2017. Uh, and uh, what was shown in this paper is that also uh, you can have extra bits of information through mu E and Y E correlation. So CMB polarizations can add more leverage to constrain FNL at a very small scale. And this is what I would like to show in this talk. But first, let's see the order of magnitude. We have a huge uh, um, uh, dynamic range between the CMB scale, 10 to the minus 2 inverse megaparsec, and the mu uh, scale, which is at uh, five order of magnitude scales beyond 10 to the 3 inverse megaparsec. So this allows for large FNL value at, la at large wave, wave numbers. So don't be surprised that you can have a CMB anisotropy FNL uh, about five uh, from Planck, but you can have 5,000 as an FNL value at uh, mu distortion scales, even with uh, a mild scale dependent FNL with, a uh, with an index of 0.6. So that's why here I show uh, the, the level of mu uh, anisotropies uh, compared to TT, EE, and, uh, and uh, TE and EE for a large FNL value of 4,500. The cross power spectrum between mu and T should be somewhere between. Uh, and uh, as you can see, for this FNL value at mu scale, mu T can be comparable to TE on large scale and uh, to EE on a smaller scale. So this means that this is really a science case for future imagers. If you can detect T, E, and E, you can a priori detect uh, mu T correlations if the FNL value is large, of course. Uh, mu E, uh, as you can see, uh, an important point is that the ratio of the mu E correlation compared to uh, E, E is larger, in fact, than mu T compared to T, T. And uh, say otherwise, if you compute the degree of correlation between mu and E versus mu and T, in fact, uh, the mu E correlations is larger than the mu T correlations. So you can uh, have uh, an intuition that uh, this can provide more constraining power. Uh, I mean, mu E can provide more, more constraining power than mu T, in fact. Uh, so the question are, can we detect mu T and mu E correlated anisotropies with a future uh, CMB satellite like Lightbird? Uh, what constraint on FNL uh, at small scale can be achieved in the presence of foregrounds? And how much do we gain on light bird sensitivity to FNL by including cross correlation with CMB emote polarization? So can we detect the signal? First, the, the spectral signatures are distinct between Y, mu, and CMB anisotropy. So in principle, we can disentangle these signals through multi-frequency observations. But of course, the foregrounds uh, obscure strongly uh, spectral distortion anisotropy. Uh, here we look for this mu distortion anisotropy at pre recombination epoch, but of course at the last scattering surface, CMB anisotropy is like a foreground to uh, mu distortion anisotropies. Uh, CIB 
uh, cosmic infrared background or Sunil Zeldovich effects, which is late time Y distortions, are foregrounds to mu distortion and isopocles. And the galactic foregrounds are very strong uh, emissions uh, at redshift zero, uh, which um, I mean, obs obscures the signal. But uh, most uh, challenging is that these foregrounds, the CMB anisotropy, is also correlated with the signal, the mu distortion anisotropy you want to reconstruct. So you have to do something with CMB anisotropy. You have to deproject them uh, in your mu map if you want to do uh, some analysis. So our analysis, we generate simulation from this theory spectra from T mu, E mu, uh, E, E, T, E, T, T, uh, using Scholesky decomposition. You can uh, build a, a mu map of anisotropies, anisotropy, um, mu anisotropy map, uh, which is correlated with the uh, temperature anisotropy of the CMB. You can see the anti-correlation on large scale between mu and T, and the E mod map, which is also correlated with T and mu map. Uh, and this, you can see the power spectrum uh, of this correlated map on top of the of the theory spectra. So well, simulation is good here. And uh, on top of this cosmological signal, we have to simulate foregrounds, thermal dust, free free emission, synchrotron, AME, CIB, thermal AZ, and uh, also in polarization, mainly synchrotron and thermal dust. And now we have to make some component separation method to uh, mitigate foregrounds and also disentangle uh, mu distortion anisotropy and CMB temperature anisotropy in the data. We know the spectrum of mu and of uh, CMB temperature and entropy, B here. So we can use uh, uh, ILC-like methods. Uh, the standard ILC method just forms this linear combination of the data, of the light bird data, let's say, with some weights, uh, such that the variance of this uh, linear combination is minimum, and the weights of a unit response to the, the SCD, the spectrum of the component of interest, here is a mu map. Uh, Five so, minutes left. Okay, I should uh, go faster, I think. But uh, this is to say that we have to be smart with the uh, component separation methods, not doing, uh, uh, I mean, uh, if you do a simple ILC, okay, these constraints allow, allow, allow you, allows you to, to recover the mu map uh, without any uh, multiplicative error, that's fine. But here you will have uh, residual anisotropies from CMB in your recovered mu map because of this term. Uh, which propagate. Uh, and if you cross correlate your recovered mu map with a T map, uh, CMBT map, uh, this term will induce spurious TT correlation in your recovered CL mu T cross spectrum. So you want to avoid that. So uh, a solution is to use a more constrained version of the ILC, where with you know, this additional constraint to guarantee the cancellation of CMB residuals. Indeed, in this case, uh, this term will be zero and you will remove any residual TT correlation in your mu T. And this is good because TT is so large compared to mu T that uh, you want really to avoid this residual in mu T. And here are the results on our light bird simulation. First, without foregrounds for a fiducial value of FNL of 4,500, uh, without binning or with binning. Uh, on the left, this is a recovered uh, mu T uh, cross spectrum in green compared to the input realization in orange and the theory is in blue. Uh, and uh, in the right, this is the EMU cross spectrum. So already you see that the error bar are smaller, as I said, uh, more constraining power from the uh, mu E uh, for uh, several reasons. First, uh, I mean, let, let me continue. This is without foregrounds. Uh, this is just to show what I said before that the standard LC method is highly biased uh, because of spurious TT correlations due to CMB residual in the new map, while the constraint ILC can recover fully the signal without bias. So let's go back to the results uh, T mu, E mu on the right, T mu on the left, E mu on the right without foregrounds. With foregrounds, the reconstructions, uh, the, the uncertainty on the reconstruction increases, of course. Uh, this is expected. If we increase the FNL value 10 to the 4, the reconstruction becomes, of course, better and better. And for 10 to the 5, uh, it's very nice. So the method works. We can reconstruct the signal uh, from uh, a future CMB measure like that, depending on the value of FNL, of course. Uh, we did some null tests. In the absence of mu distortion and isotropy, the reconstruction by constant ILC is consistent with FNL equals 0, without foregrounds or with foregrounds. So 
just to, to show if you use just a co-constructed mu t cross spectrum to constrain FNL, uh, you can see that uh, uh, comparing uh, FNL 4,500 without foregrounds or with foregrounds, uh, the, the, the sensitivity to FNL degrade by one order of magnitude. This is consistent with our earlier paper. Now, if you use mu t, you can see that the, the constraining power, mu e, sorry, is, is better. You, it's easier to construct mu e for several reasons that I said. First, the mu e correlation, intrinsic correlation is in fact larger than the mu t correlations. The foregrounds in polarizations are less complex in some sense compared to the multiple foreground intensity. And, uh, and also you, you cannot suffer from residual mu uh, anisotropies or Y anisotropy in your E map in the polarized channel. So all these effects make you that uh, a mu E can provide more constraining power on the reconstruction uh, of FNL. And finally, by jointly analyzing mu T and mu E, uh, we get the best constraint on FNL. Typically, five sigma detection of FNL of uh, 4,500 uh, at uh, about uh, 10 to the three inverse megaparsec. And uh, a limit of detection for light bird of uh, uh, about uh, uh, FNL of uh, eight, eight, eight hundred basically in the presence of foregrounds. So uh, this is the takeaway. The constraint IoT method enables to recover mu T and mu E correlated signal. Foregrounds will degrade the sensitivity to FNL by a factor of ten uh, for light bird. Uh, a light bird detection limit is uh, about 800 on FNL from joint mu T and mu E analysis after foreground cleanings. Mu E correlation, this is an important message here, can provide more constraining power than mu T correlation actually on FNL because mu E correlation degree is larger than the mu T correlation degree. Foregrounds are simpler in polarizations and the CMB mode map is free from spurious residual mu and Y distortion anisotropies. So using this spectral distortion and isotropy, Lightbird could provide new insight on the scale dependence of small scale non-Gaussianity and non-standard model of inflations, like multi inflations or inflation uh, scenario with no, non-standard initial state uh, of, of inflation. So thank you for, for listening. And uh, thank you very nice. Thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause. And uh, is there any question? Let me just anticipate that like in five to 10 minutes so the room that zoom meeting is going to shut down uh, automatically so uh, yeah I mean if that happens uh, we we reconvene a Thursday the 8 uh, at uh, 4 30 but please uh, um, also join the other uh, sessions uh, that are going to be today and tomorrow uh, okay Nabila I saw you raised your hand please yes thank you thank you very much uh, hello Mathieu thanks a lot for this talk okay. Uh, I had just one uh, very uh, short question, which is about the um, hypothesis that you uh, you make. I guess that all the other foreground contribution, astrophysical foregrounds, do not correlate with the CMB. I guess this is what you assume when you do the reconstruction with the foreground. Uh, right. Yes. That's so true. how 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 um, robust is this assumption, given that we know that there is some kind of uh, of correlation between the uh, CMB and the and uh, an other structure, or is it just uh, because it's a much larger scale, so it's uh, it's not uh, it's not affecting the result? So, so there might be some correlation between uh, CMB and some uh, uh, extragalactic foregrounds, etc. That, that, that's true. But the, the, for example, in the in the recovered new map, uh, let's see uh, the fact that uh, we we add these constraints against the spectrum of the CMB map. Uh, means that in our mu map we cancel out any CMB anisotropy. So by this mean we also eliminate any possible uh, spurious correlation between CMB and foregrounds. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. It's clear. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. Do we have any other question? Okay, Matteo, please. If there is still a little bit of time, uh, I was wondering. Uh, I mean, I, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on uh, these um, correlations and power spectra, but I assume that you expect uh, uh, an anisotropy power spectrum of, uh, sorry, in mu 
regardless of whether you have non gaussianities or, or not, right? Because of the way they are produced through the process that you mentioned at the beginning, like they are local flows of photons from over the of this region. So I assume you have a power spectrum regardless of whether you have non gaussianities or not. Can you then make uh, like constrain other cosmological parameters like standard lambda CDM with these normal power spectrum regardless of non gaussianities? Uh, so maybe there are more experts than me uh, on 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 this here, but I, I would I would expect that um, uh, the how do I say the 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 modulation of uh, uh, the spatial uh, inhomogeneity or new distortion, and so a poor spectrum of uh, new distortion entropy, arise from the fact uh, that we have non Gaussian couplings. I don't know if there are other processes that can pro uh, provide uh, uh, anisotropy of new distortions without uh, non Gaussian couplings in the sky, but maybe Andrea uh, can uh, reply to this. Uh, it's an interesting question, and I, I mean, I'm just uh, brainstorming here, but uh, I should think uh, further about it and maybe get in touch afterward. But uh, in principle, you have uh, second order terms uh, in the temperature transfer function, which in principle might correlate with new distortion. However, I have a hunch that uh, you have a separation of scales uh, if you don't have a primordial non Gaussianity coupling uh, very small scales with the uh, CMB scales, uh, you probably would end up with a very small correlation. But uh, it might be that, I mean, I, I don't know, I have to think more about it because maybe I'm wrong. I, like, no, I, I Mike, think Matteo yeah. was, was even asking about the Gaussian part and, and the answer for the Gaussian part, if that was, was the point you wanted to uh, ask. A, uh, nobody has really computed it accurately, so we don't have a real power spectrum. Normally you just assume it's a scale invariant power spectrum and B, the power spectrum definitely will be very low. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it will be extremely hard to look at those auto powers, if you will. And yeah. the cross correlation of those primordial with would not be large. So, so, so uh, in principle, your question has the answer. Yes, you should, you should be able to do it. But in practice, at the moment, we are we are very far from from being able to look at this uh, uh, properly. Um, now there's other uh, cases where you can get anisotropic signals. If you have anisotropic heating in the universe, you get anisotropic signals. So if you have, for example, primordial black hole clusters yeah, or yeah. bubble collisions or things like that, you could, in principle, look at non-standard physics again to do these mm -hmm. things. Uh, that would then be something that doesn't come from primordial non sanity uh, in the curvature perturbation uh, sector, but it would be uh, related to other non-standard -pri non primordial physics, essentially, because these are super horizon scales that we would have hope uh, at looking at. Or something that's extremely close by, right? So if you have a cluster of, of uh, primordial black holes, they will inject energy and make a, a yeah, spatial yeah, yeah. distortion. Yeah, yeah. I, I was really way. wondering whether there was something in within lambda cdm that you could do like you, it, simply because you create the spectral distortions due to the dissipation acoustic waves like tracking the uh damping tail so yeah. i was expecting some spectrum to be there anyway and but yeah i mean there, even there will if be it's a spectrum very, but it's yeah yeah but you, you, the the idea you have had of enhancing it through the correlation it would still be there like you could still enhance even this low spectrum uh through yes. these correlations mm -hmm. okay yeah thank you I think uh, we can uh, wrap it up. I don't know if uh, Jens want to say some uh, last word. Let me thank uh, again all the speakers and the participants. And uh, yeah, I think that's leave, that's uh, what we should to, definitely do. Th thanks a lot for for joining everyone, and thanks a lot for all the nice talks and uh, also nice discussion. I think that was uh, already really nice. And I hope that uh, on Thursday we will see many of you back um, in the afternoon session as well. And yeah, thanks a lot. And yes, many thanks to <laughs> you and your colleague for a great organization. I was impressed by these talks, which we are finishing at 06 minutes. It's great. New style. Yeah. <laughs> and Andrea did all the hard work, to be, to be yeah. honest. He was, yeah, I he apologize. Was the I, I was, had. Yeah. So anyway. I had to be Thanks very strict, uh, but uh, hopefully Thursday we're going to have more time to have a small discussion and a more relaxed uh, time yeah, for questions. Okay, thank yeah. you very much again. Excellent. Okay, thank thanks you, a lot, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yes, bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.
and 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 thanks a lot, uh, Rashid, and obviously also Joe for for uh, joining us. Oh, no, Joe it's made uh, right. excellent introduction. I like. Yes, it. yes, very much. <laughs> okay, yes. So you, thanks, you Rashid. Uh, see you also. So you, have, you have you have several several sessions still to attend now <laughs> today and tomorrow, I guess. Huh? Yes, yeah, that's gonna be yeah. the roundtable uh, soon, no? I yes, uh, I should. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Bye. Okay, good. Bye. Go see you later, Rashid. Rashid. See, see you there. See you there. See everyone. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Can I just end the meeting, I guess?